What's happening? Welcome to the 60th episode of the Slapstream with Georgia. I'm nearing the number of the 100, so who knows uh, if I'm going to get there or not, but I'm glad to be documenting lives and careers and opinion about space and opinion, opinions about slap bass from all these great players. Uh, and I have a great thing to tell you now. Like I'm really excited that I finally got a black Auto Slab Base t-shirt. Uh, you can do that as well at the link uh, in the description of this video. Thanks to all of you that purchased this t-shirt. I think it's a cool t-shirt. So I'll give you a second to open that link in a new tab so you can do that as soon as possible. Um, and that's the great way like to support the art of slab base and the slap stream because you're spreading the word and you have a cool t-shirt and um, another way is if you want to do donate via paypal and venmo links are in the description of this video as well or patreon thanks to all of you that signed up for patreon and without further ado i would like to introduce my guest who played with some really cool people uh, besides Mike Sanchez, great boogie woogie piano player, he also played with Robert Plant and all kinds of uh, great acts. And but I'll let him tell you about it. And I would like to introduce, especially to you, uh, Nick Whitfield. Hey, what's happening? Hey, George. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, things are getting better, aren't they? Yeah, we're letting us out now, and uh, gigs, are, gigs are going back in slowly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Is is England kind of back to normal, semi? Yeah, it's pretty much, you know, it's pretty much opened up. Yeah, I've got to say. Um, just remains to be seen now that summer months are going, whether people will cram indoors, you know, because we've had a lot of outdoor gigs, but it's getting, getting a bit cold now. So mm -hmm. the gigs are all going to be indoors, and, you know, it, We'll see how it goes, but so far, a few gigs I've done indoors have been just been like normal, really. So I don't know. I think we're all getting the uh, getting the COVID bug out of the way and kicking its ass and getting on with life. I think I don't know, or the fortunate ones, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, how do you think that you know people are gonna react? I'm thinking like it might be that people go crazy because it's gonna be yeah, we go, we can party again, but I feel that like lots of people are gonna be kind of scared and kind of anxious like oh i don't feel that great with all these people crammed like sardines next to me yeah I'm, i must admit i you know there's been a couple of things where i've known that it's going to be just gigs even attending gigs and i've known it's going to be really busy and i've kind of avoided them too um i like things you know, I'm, I'm a bit sort of half half with it really you know um but yeah i mean there was a gig that we did uh, with, with the drugstore cowboys about two months ago and uh that was a really crammed, small crammed gig, and sure enough, yeah, uh, the next week, Tom Ball, the bass player, he, he got COVID, so, yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> so, look, you know, anyone wants to get it, but, yeah, he, he, we should, we're pretty positive about it from that gig, because, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was hot and sweaty, and people just falling all over the place, and on the stage, and everything, it was, yeah, just one of those, so I don't know, yeah, I mean, um, I've had it okay over the over the the period. Um, I was fortunate that I had a couple of residency sort of restaurant gigs, nothing too wild. Oh, nice. Yeah, and they're all really well organised and outdoors um, with like a roof terrace thing, and um, you know that kind of you know kept me kept me sane. You know, having a, having a couple of gig every couple of weeks, and then and then there's there's a few bars that have had big car parks. And they set up, and there was these outdoor events. Some of them got rained off, um, but yeah, I, I did a few gigs over the lockdown. I must admit, so it, it wasn't like you do hear people. Some people saying they did, did nothing. You know, they couldn't, couldn't do a thing. So quite. Fortunate. It's been hard here. Like you know, I I played a couple of gigs, but it not nearly as uh, I'd like to play, of course. But it it was it was really sporadic, and most of them got cancelled anyway. My Tiger Army gigs in uh, they were supposed to be at the end of next month. No, end of this month uh, got canceled as well. So it's it's really tough. But 
who knows? You know, it's important that everyone is safe and that we get out of this mess as soon yeah. as possible. Um, England must be one of the most, uh, the worst, I guess, because it, it really does seem like it's opened up here. It does, you know, some of the little the big festivals are on and, you know, and uh, yeah, there's no, there's even people. I mean, there's even people in shops not wearing masks anymore, which I, mm. I don't agree with. I'll carry on wearing my mask, whether I believe in it or not, just for uh, that respect for people that do believe in it, you know, and uh, it's no, it's enough my nose to put my mask on. But as far as the bars are concerned and stuff, you know, nobody's really wearing masks anymore. Uh, at least that's how it is, what, what I've seen in, in the cities near me, so in the moment town. So. And, and where are you? Which city do you live in? I, I'm in the Midlands in England, uh, the, the uh, East Midlands, which is I'm in a town called Leicester. Okay. So right, right in the centre of England, pretty much, you know, I'm in the centre for everything, really. So, yeah. Just, well, right now you're in Slapsville. That's, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We're always in Slapsville. All right. I would like to present your whole career. So let's start with the beginning. How did you get interested in, in music? How did you get interested in bass and slap bass? Oh well, yeah. Um, I mean, I got interested in music um, quite a bit before um, I, I started even playing playing instruments. Um, so I'll explain how that happened. I, I didn't really get any um, inspiration from my parents. You know, there were, there were, there's nobody musical in the family. I got a, 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 one uncle that plays the drums, and I've never seen him play. But you know, uh, that's about it. So there's no musicians in the family, so I didn't have anything to go by for that. And also my parents didn't have much of a record collection, hardly nothing. You know, there was, uh, you know, Carpenter's album and a Cliff Richard, later Cliff Richard album, <laughs> an Abra album maybe, something like that. So I had nothing to go for for that. Um, but I was fortunate in the fact I lived, uh, in last where I live, there was a, a kind of notorious, uh, I'm talking 1978 now, so that's how old I am. But I was, uh, I was seven years old. And uh, me and my older brother, Chris, he was, he's three years older than me. We lived next, right close by. I'm talking like a stone's throw away, 100 yards away from a, a rock and roll club, which in, you know, the 70s, uh, late 70s, all the bands came through there, you know, before the big, before the big re revival, you know, so Flying Sources and Crazy Cavern and all these sort of bands. And even some of the American um artists played there as well so it's amazing that that was just like really just around the corner from my house i think billy lee riley played and ray campion there was others but i never i obviously couldn't go to those gigs i would have been in bed reading reading the vino or something you know i was seven years old but uh i used to um when i was i was a kid yeah i'd go out just riding on my bike doing what kids do and i'd ride by this club and there'd be um uh, i'd see the teddy boys and the rockers all dressed up you know waiting that i was smoking or waiting to get in the club or whatever. And I was, I was, yeah, I was curious and fascinated by it at the same time. And I thought, what's this about, you know? And um, yeah, we, we, lucky for us, we could get in on a Sunday afternoon. They did a Sunday af afternoon slot there. And there was a DJ upstairs in the room where the record, half, whatever you want to call it, happened. A guy called Mick O'Grady, like a rock, rock and roll DJ guy. And uh, my dad had let me and my brother go up there and we just we just watch and learn basically and and hear the first you know the, all, all the the classics obviously were played um and uh, you know we, all your, your little richard g men and cock and all this all that sort of stuff and then a lot of rockabilly stuff as well but um i kind of distinctly remember hearing certain tracks now uh, I, I can't you know the standards obviously we know them and we've heard them a million times but um you know to this day but it's like at the time, I remember I was hearing stuff like Lights Out by Jerry Byrne and How Low Can You Feel by Ray Campy and you'd get all the table boys stomping the floor and that, your baby walks out. You know, all that, bit, all that business. And um, I remember Reap Petite by Jackie Wilson and just certain songs that stuck in my head that I remember. Jumble Rock, Hank Mazel, which uh, features one of the best rockabilly bass lines ever and it's on the bass guitar. And there you go. <laughs> But, uh, so that that was my my start and introduction to that music, and we followed it, and it was all rather innocent, really. You know, I was I was running back and forth to the toilet to wet my hair in the sink and comb my hair back. I didn't even have it cut in like a a quiffable uh, cut, 
So I've, I've had my head in the sink and brushing my hair back and then 50 minutes later, I'll be back to it, it dry <laughs> in a pen. Um, and, uh, you know, I buy my first boot lace tie and some studs and put them in my denim jacket and all this sort of business. So, yeah. Uh, that's Were you a Teddy boy back then? No, well, yeah, I guess I was. Uh, if, if I could have afforded the drape, um, there were some kids, some rich kids <laughs> that lived near us and that they had drapes and we always like, you know, we used to, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a sneer at them. We were just jealous, really. But they, they had drapes. And, uh, but we, yeah, we just had a, a few studs and, you know, they say the bootlace tie. It was a great shop in Leicester called Trading Post. And they sold all the all the Ted gear, you know, all the stripy socks and everything. And we'd save our pocket money up and, and go there and buy stuff. Um, are there still yeah, like stores was... in England that sell Teddy Boy stuff? Is there, are there still stores around? No, no, no. I mean, no, that's, it's all gone. I mean, you can still buy a studded belt from somewhere. You still buy yeah, stripy yeah. socks, but it's probably from a novelty fancy dress shop. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> you know, um, so, uh, no, there's nothing like that. Um, there is shops around. There's one in Nottingham up the road and that do sell drapes and stuff like that. It's called, uh, I don't know what the shop's called London Boots. It's called. It's in Nottingham, but um, and they they sell sell all that sort of stuff. But it's very cheaply made. It's kind of bad repro clothing. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the only way you get it now, you, know, you get it from oh, the weekenders and you know all that. Uh, yeah, uh, online or whatever. There's not many shops. No call for it. No. But there were shops then back then. I mean, obviously those shops. That shop I was selling about this trading post shop. Obviously, they were catering for the, the Teds and the Punks, and it was just everything. It wasn't a Teddy Boy shop. It was just like, mm. uh, you know, it was just any, anything and everything sort of rebellious at the time. You know. We're still talking about late 70s, right? Yeah, that's right. So moving okay. on from that, I mean, so we, we moved away from the area. I don't know what happened to that club. I think it closed down shortly after we left. Uh, obviously, I didn't see any bands there or anything. I was too young to, to, to do that. So I just, just remember, you know, Hearing, hearing all those original records and getting into it from there. To be honest, I was so confused at that age. You know, you probably thought that the Fonz was part of a, the rockabilly movement. You know, it was just, it was just like, it was all very confusing when you're a young kid like that. But, um, so we moved away from that area. I started junior school. It was about three miles away. I started junior school and uh, this would be 1980. So I'm nine years old. And I think I've got the same story. Well, I know I have through speaking to a lot of people over the years around my age, um, not much younger than me, but old, certainly older, uh, we all have the same story, really, that, you know, I came home from school one day and I think mean, it was Tuesday or Thursday, turned on the TV, top of the pops, and on came the Stray Cats. And it's just like, what the hell? What the hell is this? You know, it just blew us away. So, you know, Runaway Boys, November 1980, wasn't it? Um, I saw that and it blew, you know, that was it. You know, all of us knew what we were, what we needed, what we wanted and needed to do. Obviously, you know, the scene was already set up, but some party set up for the Stray Cats, you know, with all the revival bands that were kicking around and, 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 and some of the English bands was, were, were, were playing before the Stray Cats, obviously, but you need a band like them to do it and, and, and they did. And it's history and you can't change it. I wouldn't. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, did you like when the Stray Cats showed up or you were like more into the guys that you heard before? No, I, I, I to be honest, I, I would have. So I, I'm, I was nine years old at that point. Uh, my brother was older. So he'd like got, I, you know, he'd do all the things that I later did. He had a paper round. So he was earning money, you know, delivering newspapers and stuff. And he'd, he'd, have, he'd buy records with his, with his pocket money. And in turn, he had, older friends that he was hanging out with that, that were in, that were going to the gigs, you know, they were old enough to go. Cause even my brother wasn't old enough to go to any of these gigs. I didn't go to a gig until 1985. So I'll tell you all about that, but it was, it was a good first gig to go to the cramps. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, um, yeah, so he, he was getting fed stuff down from his older friends and then it's getting passed along the line to me and, you know, but he, he was buying all the records and stuff. So, uh, yeah, so I was hearing all the bands and everything. I mean, it, a good example here of how exciting and quick fire everything was then is that I remember Christmas 1981, um, my mum and dad said to me, me and my brother said, oh, you can have two 
two vinyl albums each you haven't anymore you're gonna you know you're not spending all your christmas money on on records so they kind of said well you can have two two albums apiece now those four albums that we chose were now just staple classics um i i think i went for the the jets album the first jets album with the, the three heads on the silver one and i had the pole cats are go album and uh, my brother, he went for the Meteors in Heaven album, total game changer of an album that was. And he had the Blue Cats, just so wild over a rock and roll album. So we had those four albums for Christmas in 1981. I mean, can you imagine the excitement of that? It was just... Uh, you know, wow, those are great albums. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything just happened so quick then, and it did. You know, now three years can pass by and, and you know, you'll only get a couple of bands release an album. But back then, mm. three years of everything, it, you know, it, it even, you know, the, the original first wave of revival rockabilly, you know, like say the, the more neo side rather than the Teddy Boy side, you know, that, that was kind of waning by, you know, by 84 and 85, you know, before this, all the, you know, what you could call, you know, second generation bands came along and then kicked it all, you know, and kept it going. And then obviously the club foot started in, you know, what would that be, 85 or 86, the club foot? So, that'd be, that'd be 84, yeah. So, I've got, you know, the first uh, club foot album, I remember that. So, yeah, it, you know, but, all the, but the pole cats had all kind of the split and got on to do different things. And the stray cats had kind of were almost split, weren't they? They were almost gone. And chicken pyramids, they, they, they'd split. Um, so, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, it was changing, you know, the, the, the scene. But I, 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 the first, you know, those first years, I mean, I, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't old enough to get out. I didn't get out until 1985, so I missed all that. So did my brother, he missed it too, because he was only, he was young. So my first gig was the Cramps and the Stingrays at the Montfort Hall in Leicester. And that was the first gig where I, I got thrown around like a rag doll, because I just dived in there. And, yeah. <laughs> My friend, a friend was supposed to be looking after me, a guy called Tom, and he didn't. And I, I, I just ran off from him, and I was, he lost me. I was just in the crowd, being thrown around. Wow. <laughs> it was a blur. The gig was a blur. Actually, the Guana Bats were on the bill as well. They were on the bill, um, but they didn't. I don't know what happened. I, I heard a rumor that they got they were too popular and got thrown off the tour. I don't know whether the Guana Bats made that up, or it's true, but they certainly didn't do the rest, the most of the tour. But it was the sting mm -hmm. rate of Guanabats and the Cramps. I mean, what a, a great first gig. I mean, it wasn't my first gig. It's my first proper concert gig, you know. I've see, obviously seen a couple of what you call working men's club bands and stuff like that when I was, you know, going out. But something where you chose to go. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah. working men's clubs in Asa, there was, a, there's, you know, in the, through the 70s, and they're still around, actually, in certain parts of uh, the world. But, um, you know, there, there was bands on every weekend, and they'd just be playing, like, pop hits and 50s and it was always 50s and 60s and you know that mm -hmm. sort of stuff would be like some really cheesy country band doing like rose garden and all that sort of thing you know like a duo that's what, what funny thing at with. that time the distance between 50s and those early 80s that's like that's less than uh than like from that near rockabilly and now i know that's... i know it's, it's amazing isn't it when you think of it like that and you think like well <laughs> yeah yeah you don't know there's something about rockabilly for me that always has to sound fresh and that's yeah. what i liked about the early 80s neo rockabilly especially um and around that time period have you started playing any music was bass your first instrument or you played something else how did you get into playing music yeah so what happened was i mean it, and I, I never mentioned from my brother chris um he he bought the first bass into the house, first double bass into the house. This would be about 1984, I think, around that sort of time. And um, it was from a school. It was it was just they you know they looked at it through the window of this this it was like our house sort of thing, like a shed. Um, and it, it was cracked. It had one one string on it, and it it was it had cracks all over the bass. It wasn't in use. And they, they, asked, they asked if they could have it, and they said no, and you know, you know, they wouldn't let them, let them have it. My brother and a couple of friends. So they just borrowed it, <laughs> and uh, 
Yeah, we didn't end up getting it back actually, but yeah, we just borrowed it. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll say that. Um, and yeah, and we got it all fixed up. Um, my, my brother's friend Rob, and these are all the other happy guys that live up in the area. He was a carpenter, so he, he you know he glued it and cramped it up. It had cracks all down the front of it, and you know, um, luckily the sandpost was still there. Um, and uh, yeah. It, it got fixed up really well and um we couldn't have varnished it there was too many you know too many battle scars so we we, we painted it which was a real thing in the 80s uh, color color coded bases you know i mean the podcast had a pink base and matchbox had a white base and so on so we went for black black a black base with red trim on it that's the color scheme we went for and uh yeah so my brother initially got the base for it there it is oh yeah there it is that's me. Oh, well, I'm 14 there. Yeah. Look at those neck curtains as well. Oh my God. It was the 80s. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, initially my brother got to play and he was a lefty and he was just asking other people to teach him left handed. And, um, uh, but he, he just had interest and he, he just didn't take it up basically. And I did, you know, you know in the corner, I picked it up. I remember we had, it just had for about a year of me learning it just had one the one string on it that it came with when we got it and that was just a, a gut it was a gut string funny enough a, a, a d a d string a gut string and uh, at the time i thought i was doing well on this on this one string you know when i look back you know I, you could have asked me back then i would have said yeah i can play I, you know I, i've got a few songs down and i remember my friends i said oh, nick nick you can play oh you can play uh, I'm a loser by the ricochets and, and I was going to, I'd got one string on the bass. Obviously I wasn't playing it correctly, but you know, that, that's the end of the time when you, uh, you know, it's hard to remember when, when you couldn't play, if you know what I mean. It's hard to remember that, that time, uh, but obviously that was uh, how it was because I had one string on the bass. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so at the same time, uh, again, my brother bought a guitar into the house, didn't take to that either, left that, so I, I picked that up and I started um guitar and bass pretty much the same time around 1984 and i was also drumming as well I'll talk about jack of no trades master of none um my first drum kit was made out of biscuit tins and uh, bolted together and, and uh you know saucepan lids and that sort of thing it was uh, i should have never gave that kit away it sounded awesome no it was uh it was, um, roofing the roof is on the roof that does like a big like um tube that they throw the stakes down off the roof to, into a skip and i found like an offcut of this big tube and it was like about 28 inch you know on a mountain. so i just covered it in packing tape that my dad had bring over from work and made this makeshift bass drum this is all true really i put bricks in it so it would move and i managed to get a cheap bass drum bed and bolt it to it and then the rest of it was made out of like what you know like biscuit tins quality street sweet tins you know that were made of tin then not plastic and i'd cover them in tape and the snare for the snare i'd put pebbles in <laughs> so you get like a, a makeshift snare sound but i actually learned my learned my basic rock beats and my basic standard drums on that kit um so that's a little funny story there from my childhood later i would I, about 1986 i got myself a proper kit uh, a premier red kit and then i was ready to ready to uh join the band uh, so bass bass, bass came bass first came and then drums and, and then guitar they, was that the order I, I say they were all at the same pretty much you know i can't remember it distinctly but the, the, it would have been all around the same time i guess i was trying to find what i wanted to do um uh -huh. uh, and maybe i would have just carried if the bass hadn't come in the house and the guitar maybe i would have just done the drums i don't know so I, I don't know how it would have panned out, but um, I guess I would have, I, I think I would have um, gone, I would have gone for them all, uh, you know, uh, despite my brother being, bringing them in. I think I would have found them in my own way. But um, yeah, um, so around that time I was, I was leave, I would have leaving school. I left school in 1986 and I had a school band, uh, which I played guitar in, uh, we, we, we had, I didn't do music at school until the last year because they, they just had like a, a guy and he just did marching bands and, and brass, you know, do, you know just, just marching band stuff. And um, 
you know, there was no guitars or drums or basses or anything like that. And then he left. And then for one year. Sorry, so what did you play in the school band? With it, with school band, I played guitar. Okay, guitar. Yeah. Okay. I've got no, so, no pictures of that. I've, I've got some. Did you have guitar. any formal education, like proper music formal education on bass? Uh, yeah, I guess you could call it that. I mean, this lady, a lady came into the the, the school, a new a new uh, uh, music teacher called Paula, and she, um, yeah, she bought a, a drum kit into the school, and then she bought a bass, just a bass guitar. The guitar uh -huh. wasn't even, and and yeah, she teach you know twenty kids all surrounding this drum kit, all taking it in turns, and you know playing a rock beat, and she she excited, you know, people started wanting to do music again, you know, or wanting to get into it. So that was great. So I learned my first, you know, drum beats on, on that kit. It was an old Rogers kit. And then she got a, a bass guitar. I can't remember what it was. Really cheap, with theory made. And she taught taught basic 12-bar um, blues. She'd have, like, charts on the wall saying C, C, oh, C, nice. G, G, C, C, well, you know. So, and all the kids... That's helpful if you want to play, you know, neo-rockabilly. <laughs> no, no, no. But this is just a start. I mean, uh, I guess I picked it up pretty quick, you know, and... She was, she was, you know, just playing on the one, just playing on one note, you know, and doing the changes at first. And then we got, she taught me a walking bass line, which obviously then you're on your way. And, um, but that, so that was that. But I was also learning basic chords, guitar chords, and then we formed this school band, which was like a mixture of um, uh, subcultures at the time. There was, I was a rockabilly kid in the band. There was a, a heavy metal drummer guy called Neil. He was he, Iron Maiden fan, you know. And then there was a uh, all the kids that were like Bono wannabes, over so like mullet haircuts and went to U2 and all that stuff. And then there was a goth kid, indie goth kid called Jason. Um, and he, yeah, that, that was my first school band. I did my first gig with that band in, in an assembly hall in front of 300 kids. And the happy thing I can say about that is that I have actually got footage of it and it's on YouTube. So if anyone wants to see my first gig, first band, so I just put in the gangsters and strychnine, strychnine, a sonic song. Strychnine. So I start. Okay? <laughs> wow. That's YouTube. So the gangsters, strychnine. Have a look at that, and you see me in my bleached uh, dungarees uh, with a. I think I've got a Guana Bats T-shirt on underneath there. And if, if you could. Oh really? Me, oh, cool. Yeah. And that's already. What did you say? Uh, uh, that's. Um... Oh, 85, 86. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I was just, just, it was my last year at school. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, I, so we left school, the band didn't continue. We just parted, you know, all parted ways. And then my first band would be a rockabilly band called the, the Hellcats, um, which was um, the leftovers of a, a psychobilly band called the Raw Boys that were kicking. They didn't, they, nobody would have probably heard of them at Leicester, but they were like a, a, a psychobilly band that played early. 80s in in in, uh, in England, you know, they opened up for the Meteors. So any band that came by the Guana Bats or any of them sort of bands, they'd open up for them. Anyway, the guitarist of that band, um, a guy called Kevin Downs, and the bass player of Colbert Hamilton and the Hellraisers. Do you remember those guys? Um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, but, the, but they 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 did okay in the early 80s. They, they had lots of TV appearances and stuff like that in in, in England. But they, they disbanded, and the, the bass player, Andy Parks, was a, a Birmingham guy. He moved to Leicester. So, and, that, and then they found me, uh, and that made up the trio, the Hellcats. That's my first band, first record that I put out. It was like a, a track on a, a Fury compilation album. Uh, you know, uh -huh. it's a nervous records. Um, we put one one track out. I've, I've, I've dug it out, actually. Let me uh, show you this. Uh, it's probably the worst sleep ever. Um, you know, it's, it's just rotten. I, I remember I couldn't even show it to my parents. I thought it was that bad. Awful. Ha. Huh. <laughs> Take it by force. And, uh, yeah. Look at that. It's rotten. Me. But anyway, yeah. It's, uh, that was <laughs> my first record release. And uh, yeah, I did that back, back. You have it on vinyl. That's cool. Yeah. Do you have, like, you have a. Uh uh have the gangsters featured oh, there, go. there i am yeah 
that's in the that's in the drama room. There's another version where we're playing live in in this in the assembly hall as well. But see that guy there playing the bass? He's not even plugged in. <laughs> oh, you, you can see he's not playing. But you see, Jake, this guy is rocking. Yeah, that that's the uh, that's Neil. That's the uh, the guy, the high maiden guy. There's me with the quiff. There's Jason there. Um, just before you saw the singer with his sister's a mercy t-shirt on. Um, and the singer Tony Winston, yeah. Um, that's that's there you go. Well, oh, you, you look oh. happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I, I'm glad I've got that footage. I, I actually I actually had to steal that that videotape from the drama cover, the drama room cover because they wouldn't let me have it. Um, and I was leaving school and I thought I need this and uh, I'm glad I took I took it. I'm not uh, you know I mean, now but it's so great that you have that, you know, that that that, that you yeah. have that, and yeah. up on YouTube that you know you well, can you can check it out and you know That's your it. fans. Yeah. yeah, I lost all my, you know, most of my early stuff. Like some, I gave it to someone and they never gave it to me back to me. I was like, oh no, I really wanted yeah. to have that anyway. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Cool. <laughs> uh, well, I so we are. Uh, what are we talking about now? You 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 started the band. Yes, I've done the, uh, the Hellcats band. Uh, that lasted about two years. We, we did 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 all right. We you know did a lot, a lot of the rock, rockabilly clubs, ding walls, and stuff like that. And <coughs> we were friends, quite friendly with the Jets at the time. We opened up a, quite a few shows with the Jets. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, and then that, that passed. And uh, me and the guitarist went on then to form another band. This would be about 1988 called the Cellmates, which was like a more of a more of a neo rockabilly band, a bit more progressive than, than the Hellcats, which was kind of like a you know a bit more uh, standard. But um, yeah, so we formed the Cellmates. So I'm still drumming at this with this band. Um, cellmates. Yeah, with the Cellmates. Yeah. But, so, my... Are these the Cellmates? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the cellmate. That's right. I forgot I'd sent a picture on that. Yeah, yeah. That's the guy. So that so the guy sitting with his legs up. That's Kev. Uh, that's Kev Downs from the um, the Hellcats, the band before. So it was me, uh -huh. me and him, the two guys on the left. Uh, which way looking at it, I guess. Um, two guys on one side. That yeah, you can see me. I'm sure. We went. Um, yeah, we went on to form the the cellmates. Yeah. So so that that looks it, like yeah. a like a neo rockabilly or psychobilly band. That's yeah, we it was it was. I, I mean, I you know the psychobilly thing. I, I loved, you know, I still listen to In Heaven, and, and you know a lot. I, you know, it's still fresh to me. It's a, it's the psychobilly album, and, and the, you know, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know the psychobilly thing. I sort of mid eighties and and whatever, and it, I don't know. I lost a bit. I, I wasn't really into some of the, you know, the second and third generation bands that were coming in. So I, I sort of leaned more towards the neo rockabilly side. There were plenty of bands doing that, uh, especially coming out of Europe and and everywhere else. So I was, I don't know. We were kind of like the cellmates was somewhere like, like maybe like the Nitros or bands like the Ratmen, you know, um, they, you know, stuff like that where there's still a lot of rockabilly in there and it was played. You know, wait, uh, like the Red Men know. from Belgium, yeah, or yeah. you remember that? That's Walter Rose, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, I remember. Uh, uh I mean, I've uh, featured the um, the bass player from the Red Men in one I, of the slaps. That's teams. right, yeah. I, I did watch that one, that was a great interview. He was, uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. I really did. Yeah. He's, he's a funny guy, yeah, he's great. Yeah, you know, I love great stories and everything. He's good, yeah. I'm glad yeah. You, you've been watching, you've been watching the, the slap stream. <laughs> yeah, I have. It's been it's been a great thing for over lockdown. It, you know, I enjoyed. I'm trying to think of the ones where I, I, I've not seen them all, but I've seen most of them. And uh, you know, oh, cool. um, I do I do a lot of, when I'm not when I'm working. I do a lot of driving work, so sometimes well, I'm not necessarily watching, but I can put it through the Bluetooth on on my truck when I'm I'm driving, and you know, I can just sort of listen in my time, you know, work time. Sorry, you know. So sometimes I, I listen in the week, and it's it's just like. Yeah, it's crazy. It's now like I think over two hundred hours of slap bass. I think. <laughs> okay. That, that's my YouTube contribution. You know, <laughs> overload so, yeah, of slap bass. That's the cellmates. I mean, 
that album was on Rage Records, which was quite a good good label at the time to be on. Uh, we were label mates with um, the Long Tall Texans, with ah. Z and bands like that. And the Texans kind of took us under their wing a little bit. They took us, we went, uh, we accompanied them to Germany on, on a tour. That's the first tour that I did in Europe. And uh, I can distinctly remember when it was because it was just after the Berlin Wall had come down. And we were literally in Berlin, I, I want to say about three or four weeks after the wall had came, come down. And obviously there was oh. lots of the wall was still there. It was intact, but there was loads of holes and you know, rubble everywhere. And, and there was like, those guys there selling bits of Berlin Wall in like little plastic cases for, for whatever price. And you know, there's just rubble everywhere. You know, you just pick it up off the floor yourself if you wanted a piece of Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> Which oh, I interesting still find somewhere. Crazy enough, I have a bag of it somewhere. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we did, it was just after the wall came down, and we did a, a, about a, a ten day tour. Uh, I think it was a bit less. Yeah, about eight dates in in Germany. But that was with year. cellmates. Yeah, that's the cellmates okay. opening up for the long tour Texans. But we all Got traveled it. together on the ferry and in a big van, and yeah, it was a it was a messy, messy tour. You can imagine. <laughs> that must have been fun. Yeah, it was my first tour, so you know, yeah, that was great. So uh, that's yes, yeah, so that takes us up to about 1990, and um, I must get on to the double bass bit because I, I left the cellmates. I, I was a bit disorientated by. I, I was writing a lot of the songs, not, not lyrically. The Steve handled all the lyrics, but musically, I, I was so I'm, I'm back. I'm still the back drumming, and I'm writing the you know majority of the bass lines and the majority of the guitar. And I just got a bit fed up. I was just like, oh, I want to be out front. You know, these guys are having fun out there and I'm sat in the back drumming, you know. And I, I, I really got fed up of it. And I, I left the band. Um, it was, you know, it's all am amicable. And um, they carried on for a little while, but they didn't get to release the second album. They didn't write too many songs. So that just, just uh, that fizzled out. So then I did one of two things. I joined um before we go any further i would i see that you have your bass behind you i would like to hear you play a little bit if you don't mind yeah sure um you know what i was thinking about you know what you you were saying about what, when did you first hear slap bass and all the rest of it uh -huh. this kind of thing. now one record my mom did have uh, uh later on it's about 1979 i think was the elvis 40 golden grapes um, the yeah. one, the gold record with a big face on, um, on arcade. Sure. Which, and it was another starting point for a lot of people because track one, side one was, is my baby left me by Elvis. So, you, you know, you got that cracking drum beat comes, you know, the, the crack of the snare and then the, the double bass sat that, that guitar and that, and that voice, you know, and still one of my favorite, probably top 20 rockabilly songs in the world, you know, but that. Double bass intros was a real thing, wasn't it, in the 80s? I think that's what freaked my ears up. You know, everyone was doing it. All the bands had had that that, that thing going on with the, um, you know, the intros, like the Delta and, uh, and, the, and the Blue Castle. I think all the bands had one. They all had a song that started up. Uh, yeah. I'll get my bass anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, what are you going to play? We could we could play name that tune. Uh, do you remember what? So what? Like the Deltas. Remember, you know, boot, uh, Raging Sea. You'd, you'd hear that. You know, kind of. Like, <laughs> you'd hear that that intro, and you know, it'd build up, and but you know, they're the first sort of things I heard, and I thought, what, what's that? What's that sound? What's that noise? I want I want to do that. You know, and so that was uh, quite an influence. And then you know, you know the Blue Cats of the Wild. Don't... Yeah, all that, all that kind of thing. So I think they were the, the sort of things, you know, that that pricked my ears up and made me want to play double bass. So, um, yeah, hats off to to Little John and you know, and uh, Mitch Claus and all those guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what shall I play? Um, I've not got any set pieces, so I just play a, a solo or something and just give you a, a few bars of something. Yes, Mike. that sounds uh, Mike, that sounds like an excellent idea. Yeah, he always solos me. Uh, okay, let's go.
Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> I really yeah. like your playing, man. Sounds great. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to hear all your stories. We as bass players don't have a chance to get featured that much. So that's why I'm using the, 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 the sl slap stream to spread the slap seed. That, that bass, um, you know, the black bass that I was telling you about, that kind of got given away. I don't, that belonged to my brother and it got sold. I don't know what happened to that. So I actually bought that bass in um, about 1988. I had that bass. It's a Czech, Czech, Czech bass. And it's, I remember I paid about 700 pounds for it at the time. It was quite cheap, really. But it was, it was like a dark teak color, which I liked. Mm -hmm. So I like the darker brown, but I got it scratched up. So years later, I sanded it all down and it's been long for, for years now. And, um, but that, that's the only bass I've, uh, I've got and that I've ever had. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. I've got like 20 double basses. And I'm just like, you know, <laughs> I only need that one and it's been fine. You know, I don't fly it anywhere. That's great. You, you know, I never been a, 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 a collector of any kind, no. you know, that, I mean, when I was a kid, I, I did kind of collect comics, but not basses. You know, I, I needed to have enough basses in strategic places of the world <laughs> so that I can well, yeah. tour with one, but that's it. I mean, I, I, obviously, if it's a drive over to, to France or Belgium, I'll take it in if, if there's room, but I'd never fly that base anywhere. I, I always use higher bases. You know, you just have to go with go with it. Sometimes it's, it can be a nightmare. Sometimes I'll ask you later on about it, but let's um, uh, t please tell me what happened after the cellmates. Yeah, so that that then so I wanted uh, I only did two bands, uh, and this is where this will be the first band I played double bass for as a band, live band. Um, there was a band called the Hayriders in the uh, mid 80s that did that uh, was quite popular in England, and they were one of the first bands that I went to see. Um, that I saw live, and you know, I always remember loving the guys. And then they, they kind of stopped playing, and um, I got I got in touch with them around. They were, they were just doing little bits and pieces here and there, and I, I'd go and see them as and when. But uh, I kind of talked them into getting back together. I sort of said, "Look, if I, you know, I, I can organize some gigs for you because I, I was in with some bits and pieces." I said, "Can I line some gigs up? You know, I'll play bass." You know, and I said, "Yeah, sure." You know, so we did that. And um, yeah, so they were my first gigs. The bank with the yeah, the, the Hay Riders. They're, they're back together now and, and, and really busy. You know, they're they're playing all the time. Um, so, but I yeah, I, I I did them for about two years, sort of thing. So that was my first getting out and playing double bass. So so there's that band, and then there was a band called the, I did a guitar band with uh, called the Skinny Bop Trio, which I think I sent a photo of that one to you possibly. Let me let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know these these are s s small s small photos now, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a little awesome. harder to say. Too uh, many bands. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a good. I think I is this the one? Ah, uh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. All right. You see uh, the double bass player there. He that's the bass player from the cellmates. A guy called Mark. Now, when the cellmate split, he came with me, and you know, and then we, the, the, the drummer guy standing up with a bow tie, that's a guy called Dave, and he he ran a music store in Loughborough, which is just a town just up from uh, from Leicester, and he ran a, a an instrument store and rehearsal space. So we used to get a lot of gigs because people would come in and say, um, you know, we, we need a band, any band, you know, and he'd say, oh, we, oh, you need the Skinny Bop Trio, and then you know, so he took us in, and we we used to get like end of term student balls because look is a, a student town um it's got a university there and everything so we used to get a lot of those and we it, we've got a lot of wedding gigs it's a bit of a corporate sort of band it earned a lot of money um it's like looking you know we didn't do many uh scene scene rockabilly rock and roll gigs we did a few but not too many um yeah it was it was more you know, i earned a lot of money when i was in that band uh, you know because i was working i was I was working as well, you know, at a day job. So, yeah, we were out every every weekend, sometimes midweek, and yeah, uh, that lasted about two years, and uh, two or three years possibly. So that would take us up to 1984, around that sort of time. 
Um, and as, I don't know. I, my taste was changing it up to that point. I, I discovered a lot of different stuff, and um, one one band in particular really had, had played a big part in that. Um, I, we used to go to a record store, and there was a big rockabilly section, and we'd look at these records and we'd pick out. And we look at this record and we go, who's these guys? So we're all dressed in double denim and cowboy boots and long, longer hair and all this stuff. So we're all curious who these guys were. And, uh, yeah. And now we're talking about 90s already, right? Oh, Paladin. So great. The That's an excellent yeah, album, man. Yeah. So that was, that, that was a game changer for me. I, I mean, I heard that in, it, I would have heard that when it came out, you know, it was probably around. 89 88 i think um but it took a time it took a while at first you know being just being a rockabilly neo psychabilly kid you know I, I didn't like everything it took a while to adjust to it but then you're maturing as you're going along and you you, you know and it but that was one band that that obviously that's the second album but i picked up everything else but it was one band that led me broaden my horizons and i i moved to different areas within roots music i was getting more into blues then and more into country and um you know before the, you know americana word sort of came about you know it was it sort of led me out to, to, to different things i was i was just digging in different areas um and uh you know i was, I was picking up tv record records and um you know just, just different different stuff and uh, listening to jimmy hendrix and you know they turned me on to a lot of different stuff like that. It's a real influential band to me um and uh, yeah, my next band would be trying to find a band like that, because in England there was in the in the nineties there was a real big blues circuit, real healthy blues band circuit. You could be playing every night of the week if you wanted to. Um, every town had, had a blues pub or, or club, and uh, I wanted I wanted a piece of that, and I was I was desperately trying to find something like musicians or a band like the Paladins. And I couldn't. It took ages, and this is a this is a part part where I had about a year out of music trying to find something, and uh, eventually I did. I found a guitarist, and um, he, he you know he was great, and he he loved the idea of it, and he he got all the Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff down, and you know, um, so we 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 tried that, and the sort of fabulous Thunderbirds sort of sound, you know, and um. <clears throat> I mean, we tried, I tried to put Paladins together, basically, I was on bass and, you know, and we, we, we took we that painful thing of trying to find a drummer that could swing and shuffle as well as everything else. And, uh, you know, we, it took us a while to do that, but we finally got some young kid that, that, that was uh, eager and, 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 and learned the stuff and did it. And we got almost ready to gig, you know, it takes a long time to get a band together, you know, to get a full, to get like 245 sets together, you know. You, you, know, you got to throw throw a bit of filler in there to, to make your first gig, and but we had a good band together, and uh, it, it just fell apart because the guitarist had to. He, he was a you know working musician. He did tuition, and he 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 had to earn money. He had a family to support and everything else, and he got offered a job with a a guy called Jimmy James, was in Jimmy James and the Vagabonds. I don't know much. Of, I don't know much about Jimmy James, but um, had some hits and stuff. And uh, they were playing all the holiday camps, and he got offered money for big, gig, big money for gigs. So he, he just had to fold them. So I, I was bandless there. And I just felt like, uh, you know, all that work and didn't, didn't get me anywhere. So um, I put an ad up in um, a music store, double bass player Seeks Blues Band, um, in, in a local uh, local big music store. And uh, yeah, I got a couple of calls. It's a funny story here, really. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing on my part, but it's it's worth telling. Um, I, I got a call uh, saying, oh, this, this, this guy on the end of the phone. I'm not going to I, I try and you know, pull off an accent because I, I'm crap at impression. So. But um, he goes, oh, uh, hey, I'm the godfather of, I'm the godfather of Scar. I am the godfather of Scar. And he's come shouting down the phone at me. I'm like, it's this guy. And he's, he said, uh, you know, I look. I'm looking for double bass players. Says, um, you know, I, it's not. It's not specials. It's not. It's not madness. This is proper scar. You know. And he's, he's, I'm thinking somebody's winding me up here. Um, and uh, just before he puts the phone down, he says, "Well, you think about it. My name's Laurel Aiken. You think about it." And he puts the phone down. <laughs> now, I. It's a bit shameful, but I didn't actually know Laurel Aiken was at that point. I didn't. Um, 
this is yeah this is a star band this is the, the late a later lineup of that that and that's as uh that's um neville, neville staples popping up with us to to do to do a few numbers at a festival but yeah there's uh drew stansel and and daryl with guitar drew stansel actually did four years with the specials um he's not with them now he did it that was about eight years ago he, he toured he was with the specials for uh for four years so he, he did really well in, in in his world you know in his scar world because he's, he's the former member of that band the scar band oh because you got scar but that, that was later obviously but um i got so i got this call from this um, this, this guy lauren aiken and uh, i thought well who can i who can i ring to check i oh, know nick murphy who is uh, a, a, a friend a good friend and uh he's in one of the biggest scar bands that ever was in leicester so i ran nick up to say uh Got a call from this guy. He says his godfather of scars, Laurel Aitken, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Laurel, yeah, yeah." I didn't even know he was living in Leicester, and he said, that. "I said, yeah, it's Laurel Aitken, mate." And I was like, "Oh, oh god, shit!" You know? So uh, we put the phone down, and I thought, "Oh no, I'm going to consult my uh, History of Rock uh, Bibles that I've got upstairs." You know, there's a publication called History of Rock. You know, it's a great, great magazine. And um, I went into the, looked in the index on the. Uh, on the index part of the, the Bibles, Laurel Aitken, and there's about 10 pages on the guy, and I'm just like, oh no, what have I done here, you know? And uh, Laurel never did ring back, so I didn't get the gig. But uh, yeah, but uh, Nick, the guy, Nick Murphy, you know, he said, oh, you, oh, I can't believe you didn't know who Laurel was. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know, it sucks. But I said, if you had had Joe Clay ring you, or Johnny Carroll, or Charlie Feathers, you, you wouldn't have known who he was, you know? So I don't, I don't take too much stick for it. <laughs> that's a cool story and thanks a lot for sharing all these photos it really yeah, helps yeah. kind of like yeah. putting everything in a perspective yeah uh yeah so so you were playing so so what kind of music were you playing were you playing ska uh with the yeah we all pussycat that 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 would have started around that would have started around the same time as i started the drugstore cowboys 1996 now we're moving to just only a year later but uh, that that year where I tried to do something and it just didn't work and i, I played in a few bands it was about a guy called dj baker uh blues brand and that was like a harmonica led chicago blues sort of sound anything from you know there was, there was a slim arpo through to um to alan wolf and all stuff like that I did that for that was on and off all over that period um he, so that was good to do that was double bass but you know, there's no recordings or anything. We just did the odd gigs here and there. But that was a good uh, uh, education as well. You know, get see moving more over to the blue side and of uh, things. And then, um, yeah, and then I started the, 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 the El Pussycat thing came in. That was more. It started off a more really authentic band. There was no two tone uh, in there. It was all like the real, you know, late fifties, you know, the Jamaican dancehall sixties ska stuff. Were you slapping at that band at all? um there'd be probably a couple of tracks that i did yeah mm -hmm. yeah I'd stick but not predominantly it. no no just where 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 it, where it needed to be I mean, we're still together this old pussycat we never we hardly play all the guys were like that were they're all like seasoned leicester musicians and they're all playing in, in good bands and doing good things mm -hmm. get us together it's like a fluke really but we but it is a well, well old machine we can get together and we you know uh you know, and it's just like we've never, we've not been anywhere. You know, we we we, we just put it back together in, in an instant in the same day, basically. So we do, we do, we're still playing that every now and again. You know, Elpis the Cat is called. Um, I, there was, there, we did do a CD um, live at the Donkey at my local venue, uh, and uh, yeah, we did, we put out a CD, but it was a, uh, it was only on a self-release sort of thing. You know, we did a thousand copies of something. That's all it was. But um, yeah. So that that was on on in the background and then, yeah and then um that would take me up to 1996 where I started my drugstore cowboys um this is obviously switching back to vocals vocals and guitar which you know which I'm still that's, that's been that's my big baby that band you know that's my my thing you know and uh, I love it you know it's, it's my favorite thing to do but um yeah so I play bass in the band I do. Some of the recordings on the albums. I'm on all of the albums. Uh, no, the second, the second and the third album. I play play bass on uh, probably half of the tracks. You know, um, sometimes it's easier just to write the songs and you know, rather than teaching a dog out to bark sort of thing. You know, it's fucking, 
I'll I just, I just do some of, the, some of the bass myself and then I give, give the rest to Tom. Tom will sometimes, you know, put his own stamp on, on things. Tom Bull. Um, yeah, so, and we're still going, ready to do another album, almost. Uh, I don't know, I'm a bit, like, lost as to what, what to do with it. The, the, the age of the, the CD thing seems to have burned out. You know, it's so hard to clear CDs now. That was always a, the glory years, I think, the CDs. You can make a lot of money for, you know, it's cheap to put out, easy to transport, you know, take around with you. Now, vinyl's really expensive. It's hot, you know, you, you got to fit in your suitcase as well and you know all this sort of thing and then, and then the download thing it's it's peanuts really for a band of our level you know it, you know you've you got to really sell as you know high units to to make on the on the downloading side i get my little seed baby checks come through from every now and again but uh i don't know yeah it's just, it's just like the, the good years are gone but the, the cd thing was so easy wasn't it it was uh yeah you don't even get CD players in cars anymore, and you know. Oh yeah, it's, it's just, you don't have albums anymore, as as we talked a little bit at the beginning. You know, people have been releasing singles, you know, yeah. with a whole streaming thing, which I'm kind of I kind of like it a little bit. I I kind of don't like it. I like I do like the concept of the album, but I also kind of like the idea of singles. It's kind of like a back in the fifties when you know, artists were just doing, you know. They they pushed for a good song for a single. That's what they kind of cared about, not the whole package. Let's say. Yeah. So, but I I and I think that both have like their own uh, advantages. So, yeah, yeah. where did you move after that? Like, what what what's going on? Um. So yeah, I just did the drugstores. Um. Yeah, pretty full on. There's always been bands. That, the band's not worth not say not worth mentioning, but it's just like there's always. I do a lot of debt gigs, and you know, there's, there's make there's like a collective of Leicester musicians that, that kind of get together and and play, and we, we'll just knock out you know, fifties and sixties stuff, and it's not it's all covers and whatever. But it's, there's a group of us, you know, there's like three bass players, three drummers, three guitars. Um, you know, we, we kind of ring around if there's a gig going, and we'll you know, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll take it on when we're not busy and. You know what it's like. Um, you have to have your fingers in a lot of pies to, to make a living as a musician. You know, uh, for sure. I mean, I didn't. I didn't give up my job, if you like, until until I met Mike. You know, until I joined Mike Sanchez, which would be, you know, um, that was uh, when I joined Mike uh, about two thousand and seven. Yeah, that's, uh, that was that was the game changer for. Um, of what I could make a living out of this thing, you know. When, when I started with Mike, he was he was very busy, and I'd still got the drugstores, still got El Pussy Cat, still got all these things. I, I could easily quite make a living out of it, and uh, it's not a rich living, but it's, it's a happy living. And, you know, uh, we, we you know we were we had a very busy time uh, for many years. Then with Mike, well, yeah, to to the present day, really. I mean, but I, we hope to get back to it when things get better. Um, but uh, Mike's, we, Mike, Mike. So in Spain now, he's in Spain. So uh, all the, you know, so like it's not feasible for him to come over and just do a couple of gigs in England. You know, we need like a tour or we need, you know, it's, especially now, you know, he's not too happy about the traveling and he's very um, cautious about the COVID thing as well. So I don't think we'll be working together this year, but maybe next year we can put a tour together. Uh, I've got to speak to him because I've had a few inquiries. So uh, that'd be good to do. There we are. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting point to mention uh, the guy uh, to, to the left of Mike there, that's Tom Ball. That's that's my bass player for the drugstore Cowboys. Now he's a he's a fabulous, fabulous bass player, but a great he, he's a great guitar player. Now he we swap roles in those bands, you know. I play guitar with the drugstores and he he's a bass player and then and then uh, you know he plays great guitar for Mike. And I, I'm on the bass, so it's you know it works because uh, if the drugstore cowboys are not playing you know, or, or we or we take a mic gig over a drugstore cowboys gig. It's not like either of us are gigless, if you know what I mean. So and we've done a, quite a few double bubble gigs as well, where we say, oh, um, you've booked mic, but do you realize you know, there's another band within this band, you know, that sounds nothing like it's like two, two different ends of, you know, we're more country now than than ever. Um, so Mike's, Mike's, you know, rock and roll and R&B, and we're, we're 
country. So, uh, and Mark, Mark, the drummer there, Mark Morgan, he's been with Mike for years. Um, so, and it, it, when Mike did the um, Bill Wyman band, he did that for about four years. He fronted that, Bill Wyman's Rhythm Kings. This is after the guitar play was, and in between when Mark went solo, um, <clears throat> Mark, Mark came along and did a load of gigs for drugstores. So, he, he, so we, we've kind of got two bands in one, if it need be, you know. So promoters, this and that. Oh, yeah. But um, there was, there was things that, that I, I, actually, I'm jumping ahead, but with, we'll come back to the mic thing if we can. Um, a couple of things that it kind of led to me probably getting getting a job with Mike because I worked with uh, a couple of people that Mike, Mike really respects. Um, I, I, I played with Paul Ansel's number nine. I did a stint with him for, I don't know how long it was, but it, it wasn't too long. It was about eight months or so. I did with Paul Ansel. Uh, Paul Ansel used to and play with that's, uh, that's around in, in 2000s already, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. So we're, we're, we're around 2005. No, oh, really? I, I played with Paul in. When did I play with Paul? Well, no, I, I moved to the States in 2004. Right. So I, I think it got to be 2006, maybe. Yeah. Just like a yeah. couple of shows in the States. Yeah. I think. I, but that yeah, was I, kind of part of the Scotty Moore band. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He was. And, um, but, but Paul had also guessed with Mike. It, Mike had a big uh, R&B review thing, like an 18-piece uh, big band with the Extraordinaires, you know, backing singers. And he had a Meldon May as a, as a back, mm. not a backing singer, as a guest singer. And, and Paul Ansel was a guest singer as well. So there was, that was a connection. Well, Paul's always, obviously, Mike have always been acquainted, but, you know, they worked together at that point. So I'd done that uh, with Paul. So that, uh, yeah, I did about eight months with Paul. You know, he's known to have a shift in lineup, but we're all good. We're all good. It's all uh, amicable. And uh, I see him around here and there and stuff. So that's cool. Um, yeah. I ran into yeah. him like in a, a, a in a barber shop in Germany. Right. I forgot. Yeah. I think it was Hamburg. Pretty sure it was Hamburg. Um, yeah. But like a few years ago, I, you know, when I was on tour with Tiger Army, he played a, a show. Uh, like a rockabilly weekender or something like it was go getters and 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 the number nine it was a fun show i had a chance to go to that uh, after mine so it was cool yeah number nine it's a it's a great band i mean i remember the audition for for that um i just went to see them and i was kind of headhunting bands really i wanted to be in some bands that were doing you know better or whatever so i thought i can i, I can do better than this you know than you know I thought I should be out there playing my double bass for a start because I was obviously I was doing guitar with the drugstores, but I thought I'd just get out and do my bass. I actually went down to a show in London to see Paul and uh, I handed him a demo um, of, of some of my drugstore tracks that were the more country tinged stuff that we that we do uh, at that time. And um, I also uh, I had studio equipment at that time, so I'd, I'd actually done this thing where I. I uh, recorded some along to some of his songs, uh, just a, uh, about three or four songs, and sort of panned, panned the bass over to the left and the music to the right. And I just sort of said to Tony, I gave it to Tony, and said, look, and Tony's a guitarist. I said, yeah, this is me, look, I know how it is, finding these finding decent players. I said, look, you've got everything here, there's a CD. Pan that over to the left and you can hear me playing along. Yeah, I can replicate whatever you want me to do, you know. Um, and uh it worked you know it's as simple as that and uh you know i got a call within uh, a week or so paul rang me up and i said oh, you know sounds great man you know come down and do some gigs you know and that was that and i uh, you know i was in for that short time and i i, and I repeated the same process with with Dale Hyam, um as well and uh it sounds like over the top and a bit of a funny way around to do it but all i know is that if if somebody did it for me and, and gave me that peace of mind and sort of said, look, you know, it's, it's, it's what I sound like. This is what I can do. You know, you, you don't want to be like embarrassing, um, you know, auditions and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't want to be doing all that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, it, it, if the roles were reversed and, you know, I, I, I sort of love that, you know, that, that would work for me too. 
and it did for Daryl, right? So I, I did this, this demo for Daryl, and it was for Daryl, really. It wasn't for Slim Jim. I didn't know about that he was working. I didn't know that that tour was coming up. Um, I'd seen Slim Jim. Well, we opened up for Slim Jim, uh, that, that trio with Daryl, and when Johnny Bowler was doing it, Johnny Bowler was, did, did the tour before I did it, and, and another guy as well called Huey Moore um, from uh, the Ragtime Wranglers. Uh, he, 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 did, he did a tour with Jim. And then, uh, have you worked with Jim, George? With, uh, with yeah, 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 I worked with uh, I worked with Jim and Lemmy in uh, Headcat. Yeah, oh, that's was that that Green Bay thing? Did you do that or? I did the Green Bay. Yeah, that's actually where I met Mike Sanchez. Yeah, right. What that? Oh God, I remember reading that lineup. That was bonkers. That lineup. It was just everybody. And everybody. it's crazy. Yeah, I mean that festival was just like, like wow. <laughs> I oh, know it it's, never it's, happened it's, before, never happened after. No, was it some big tax write off or something? I don't know. I don't know. I'm really deal, but... forward to you know, put that together. You know, it's, it's, it's... the guys that organized it, they were really into rockabilly. I mean, they still are, and they uh had that casino behind them, you know, so they wow. wanted to do to, to push for rockabilly shows, and they were putting out like rockabilly shows even outside of that festival i played there quite a, quite a few times quite a few times they always treated us really nicely it was you know i always enjoyed i played there not at the f festival but i played at the casino with deke dickerson probably like four or five times yeah uh, even that's in wisconsin and uh and that Green Bay Festival, I played with you know with Jim and uh, uh, Jim and Lemmy and Danny B. Harvey. It was fun. It was really fun. Yeah, Lemmy. Never met, never met Lemmy. But yeah, uh, Mike's got some decent photos of him and Lemmy, you know, giving it the finger and everything. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was the coolest. That was good. So yeah, that's what. Um, yeah. So I, we opened up for the gym when Johnny Bowler was on the base and the, this was a drugstore so in, in, in leicester um yeah and then, um i'll say yeah i gave daryl this this demo and he, he rang me up for the, the slim gym tour he said can you come and do this slim gym tour and so uh i was working at the time i had a job and uh, i didn't have any this was a problem with the working thing why well, shortly after i i gave up the job i jacked in the day job and, and, and never looked back but um i uh yeah, I, I said, look, I've been offered this, this opportunity to tour with, you know, all the heroes, if you like. Um, can I get this on this holiday or can I get this time off? I'd, I'd used all my holiday up and they said, no, you know, my employer said, no, we can't do this. You know, and I said, well, you know, sorry, but I'm in, mean, you know, you can say to you, you know, I'll, I'll just have my notice in right here and now. So, um, and yeah, I gave them my, my resignation away and, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they buckled in, in the end. Wait, so, and, uh, so you quit your job to do that gig? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, it's just being told that you couldn't do it. I mean, you just regret it for the, the rest of your days, you know. And looking back now, yeah, yeah. it's obviously the right right decision to make because it's, it's something that's on your CV, isn't it? It's on your, it's on your uh, you know, uh, it's on the list of things that you can, you can, you know. Cause that's what happened. So I did the Slim Jim tour and... Uh, yeah, it's great. You know, we, we, we went all over the place and uh, it's good. Yeah, Jim Jim kind of kept himself to himself. He's a friendly guy, you know. Um, we have no rehearsals or anything. I remember heading to the airport and Dowering sort of says, oh, just be, be standstead, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was, you know, I don't even know if I had a set list or anything, but we, we turned up and uh, turned up at the airport and met Jim there, literally in, in, the, in the queue for the plane. You know, we'd not spoken or not anything. I'm, I'm sat, sat next to Jim on the plane and I'm just, I'm not, I'm not even thinking um, I'm next to Slim Jim, you know, uh, from the straight cast. I'm just looking at his arm and looking at the tattoo and going, God, that, that arm, I remember, you know, you know the straight cast singles when you see the arms on the... You know, oh, yeah, yeah, the <laughs> first the Runner Boy single. That's that, that's that tattoo that I used to just look at and look at when I was a kid, you know, and uh, it was kind of strange, but yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, it went well with Jim, Jim kind of in, in the, the bus that we had, uh, like a splitter bus thing. It wasn't like a, you know, it was nothing special, but it was like there was like a compartment above the back where all the gear was. So it was like about a foot, a foot wide. And Slim, Slim Jim just slid into that. <laughs> just, just kind of pushed him in. 
you know, and put him away after a kick. You know, and he just laid it. He just laid, he just laid it out all, all the while whilst we were travelling, just reading his book, and you know, but yeah, he was friendly, and you know, we, we had a good time. But um, how many yeah. shows have you done with him? I did. Um, I think we did. We did a, uh, only about 10, 10 or twelve sh shows, maybe. Um, okay. Most. Of, uh, I'm trying to think. We started in France, and then we went to. Uh, there's a lot of gigs in Germany, we, all, quite all over Germany. And then there was an Aust a gig in Austria, and then we went flew to Sardinia for a gig on a beach. Remember that? And then, and then we came back and did one gig in the UK in Birmingham, um, so just to, just on the end of the tour. Nice. So, yeah, so it's good, good to work with a straight cat, you know. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's fun. <laughs> but yeah, so I would meet Mike Sanchez um, at a Funny enough, at a Chris Isaac concert, I went to went to see Chris Isaac with Mark Morgan. She's Mike's drummer, and Mike came along, which is surprising because Mike, knowing Mike as I know him now, he doesn't go to many gigs. He's you know he's not a guy. He's not you won't start finding him down the pub all the time and stuff like that. You know, uh, but he, he came out to see um, Chris Isaac at the uh, Wolverhampton Civic Hall, and I got sat in with him, and I knew he'd been using some debt players because at the time. His basis, Al Gare, was doubling up with Imelda Maybank, who was just about to kind of break, you know. So he was splitting his time between the two bands. So he was using that, and I, I sort of said to him, look, you know, here's my resume. I, I've worked with this, I've done this, done that, you know, all I've done, which obviously was a good card to play, because, he, you know, they're good friends, and the, the same thing. And he, he just knew, I mean, business, and basically, I got a call. Uh, weeks later, um, probably two weeks later, Nick, can you do a gig at the 100 Club in next week? You know, so my first gig with Mike was at the 100 Club. I had like, you know, 30 songs or more to learn. Um, obviously, I knew some, knew some of the songs. But yeah, but I nailed it and went down. He was happy, he was happy with it. And I would sort of depth with Mike. I'd, I'd sort of take the gigs that Al couldn't do um, for maybe a year or so. I think, yeah. And then that would be around 2008, 2009. That's when Imelda broke with the, the Johnny Scott Boom Boom thing. Uh, on She did the Jules Holland later show and uh, everything just exploded for her. So, yeah, Al had to hand his notice in with Mike because, you know, and concentrate on the Imelda thing. So that's so then I, I just slotted into the job from there on. And uh, I'm still there, as far as the, the English band is concerned, you know. Yeah, that's the mics. That's how I met Mike. But, um, Mike, yeah. Um, I, and the gig with yeah, Mike led you like to play with lots of great artists, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, just what I was going to say. I mean, Mike is responsible for... A lot of the great things that I've done have been been through Mike. Um, you know, just straight up, it's I've had the, the best experiences, some crazy experiences. You know, I've, I've travelled a lot. You know, a lot of we, when we when we first in the earlier days, we we, we travelled. We, we were flying. I'm probably doing like about eight gigs, nine gigs a month, something like that. Mike doesn't do big tours. He do, he's not a fan of. You know, he he, he don't want to do that. Um, so we'd fly out over weekends, but we, you know, I'd probably be flying out like the, the, the higher part, you know, definitely going out like four times a month, you know, to different places. And then we'd have gigs in London and wherever else in England, you know. So with that and all the other bands I'd got, I was making a comfortable living. I, I didn't have to work. Um, you know, I did a bit of agency driving on the quieter months, you know, when, on January and February, you know, it was quiet. So I'd, I'd, I'd do a bit of agency truck driving and uh, which you can just take or leave. I still do that now. I'm doing a fair bit of it at the moment, obviously, with how things are. But um, it's the good position to be in. I'm just a happy driver. I don't have to, um, you know, I'm not working for the man, this sort of thing. You know, I'm just listening to, I'm just driving around and listening to music all day. So what could be better? It's a good job if you've got to work. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the mic thing. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, We've had some amazing times. Um, but he's, Mike's got friends in in high places. He's, you know, uh, I mean, the big time playboys. This is the thing. I mean, back in in the eighties, mid eighties, there was only like a 
a handful of bands, you know, it's not like today where you, there's so many great R&B bands around now that it's, it's you know, saturated with them now, they're all over the place and, and very good, especially out of Europe, you know. And now, but at the time in London, there was, there's only a, like a, a batch of handful of bands, you know, you've got like, you know, covering the whole R&B across to, you know, the 40s, the 40s stuff to the swing to, to whatever, you know, you've got like the Big Town Playboys, the Chevalier Brothers, Rent Party, um, you know, Helen Wolf and the VJs, you know, doing a more harmonica solely sort of thing. It was, a, yeah, it was a, there was this, this batch of bands and there was others, you know, the Stargazers and stuff. And um, yeah, they were the, the guys on the block, you know, the, the you know, in, in London, you know, the, the people were talking about and it wasn't long before Eric Clapton um, asked, asked the, uh, the big time playboys to open up for uh, for two, for a few, a few shows at the Royal Albert Hall, consecutive nights, you know. So they played the Royal Albert Hall in London and opened up for Eric Clapton. Um, I mean, the Robert Plant connection with Mike, that goes back a long time because they've, they've been, they, they grew up in the same sort of town. Yeah, that's the tour that we did with Robert. That's the last tour that we did with Robert, uh, opening up for his band, um, the uh, Sensational Space Shifters. Yeah. So that, that was uh, Mike's not in the picture because he was off selling uh, selling his wares. He was selling his CDs and his merch. So uh, unfortunately, we, that's the only moment we could get all the guys together, and we took that photo. But yeah, Mike, sadly, I should Photoshop him in there. I think no, you know we, we have we have we have the technology. <laughs> <don't we? laughs> yeah. Oh, that one. Oh, that's. Yeah, this you see, this is the thing. So Mike's always had a, a good um, relationship with Robert. I and mean, the big time playboys used to play. They did actually back back Robert up for quite a few gigs, where you know where I've not actually done that. I've played with Robert, and he guests with us, and we played parties for him, like family parties and stuff. And he, he'll get up and play with us, or we'll just call into one of our gigs. Sometimes there's a gig that we do, a particular gig where he's showed up a few times, he's up on stage. He's a, he's a real Antwerp guy. He's not, he doesn't hide away. He's not hard to find, you know, he likes his football and he, you know, he, um, you know, you can find him in a record shop, you know, he's, he's not one of these guys that's so elusive that you don't, you know, you, you can see him around. But uh, that, that, that gig there, that, that picture there, that's, um, it was his ex-wife, I can't, I can't remember her name, but uh, his ex-wife uh, rang Mike up and said, I'm after a country rockabilly band because we're having like a, a fancy dress hoedown sort of thing, uh, which was turned out to be this big marquee in the field with haystacks and all this sort of stuff. And it, uh, of course, Mike said, oh, uh, yeah, you need the drugstore cowboys. So we got the gig. Uh, so we played played for that. And um, yeah, towards the end of the set, Robert Robert got up with us and we thought, oh, the script is going to probably be a, a number, you know, or two. And uh, he ended up doing about eight numbers with us or something. Uh, so that was that was that was great. You know, I've got a couple of other photos, but that's the. Uh, but sad, sadly, no footage of it. But um, but that yeah. That He's a big cool. rockabilly fan, right? Oh God, yeah, he knows more about rockabilly than rockabilly is rockabilly from Rockabillyville. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh yeah, I mean, no, he, he know he knows so much about it. He, yeah, he, he is. You know, you know total rockabilly he knows he knows all about it i remember on you know that tour that we did with the space shifters there was one gig in france and we, we, we were in this we were in the in the in this big garden this big chateau and we, we're getting changed in in in, in the house and, and heading out uh, for our support slot and uh we passed by the a teepee in the garden that's been set, set up and it's just like uh it's like that odors coming out like joysticks or whatever you were burning on his oil burner or whatever and it also was blasting out Race with the Devil with Gene Vincent, and I remember just walking by going, yeah, <laughs> it's just like, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you've heard the Robert Plant and the Space Shifter stuff, it's like real, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you can put your finger on it as to what's, you know, it's, it's all sorts of things, you know, I wouldn't like to describe the music, but there he's listening to Gene Vincent before he goes on stage, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, but no, that, that tour was so much fun. Um, we, you know, we, we, we even boarded Robert's private jet on two or three of the gigs, I think. So we were going for these little private airports, and we got on got on a, on a little a little jet with the band. The band was were great, great friendly guys. Um, 
yeah, you know, and uh, and after the gig, sometimes we'd have a day off, and Robert would just come out and have a drink with us. You know, he didn't wear he's got in shades and with a hat on and hiding himself. He was walking out. It's funny sometimes to see people double taking. You know, yeah, is that Robert Plant? Is that you know? <laughs> but sadly, sometimes that's all great. Hassled. Yeah, he did get hassled sometimes. We were in a bar in uh, in Sicily. It was in Italy, and it was a penis themed bar. I can't remember the bar Teresi, I think it was called. And every it's just there's just penises everywhere. Everywhere you you know you can't put your hand down on anything without putting your hand on a penis. Even the, the chairs have got like penises on the end of the arms. It's just sort of like absolutely bonkers place. And uh, we were drinking in there, and we had we had we had a great night there. And uh, yeah, but that night I think it was that night he got hassled. Just people wanting to sign stuff, and it's like oh, you know they won't take no for an answer. It's a beer mat or something. You know, it's just like get out of here. And it, you know, it upset him, and he, he went. You know, but he, it's, I've seen that a couple of times. Um, where you know, you, you can be around people, but people just sometimes don't don't know when you know to, when to respect somebody's privacy. You know, you don't want to, especially if you're eating or something like that. You don't want people coming around asking you know, for stuff. You know, I don't know. Sure, like everyone has it, you know its own approach. I respect uh, privacy. And you were talking a little bit about uh, gigs in Italy. How about how about the Nasty Boys? <laughs> oh yeah, well yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a place! And I remember when I played that club for the first time. It got to be ten years ago or eight at least, something like that. But I was like, <laughs> yeah, oh, big, big this old, club uh, is called Nasty Boy. Boys. What, what's that going on with that? <laughs> so funny. Yeah. It's great. I mean, uh, I played there. Uh, I played there with, with John Lewis on, on a tour that we did, and then I played there with the Go Getters as well. Oh, that's there. We, there we go. There's John uh, being fed tequila by Diego there, and uh, Gary, Gary Agar, who is a, a seasoned drinker. He's he's looking in shock. So, uh, but I, I like the way John's hands are just hanging by his side, like he's got no control over this situation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious but no he, he's great yeah that, that nasty boy saloon yeah there's another one of me and john that's from high rock league yeah but, uh, yeah so yeah we'll get on to john in a, in a little while i've got some things to tell you about john it's all good john don't worry <laughs> but yeah nasty boys diego he's uh yeah the big cowboy guy and then his, his, and his wonderful wife pally and they've got a massive dog. Did you, you did you ever meet the dog Tequila? The dog is called Tequila. And it's, it's like a horse. It, it's been a while. You know, it's really been a while. I, I I forgot. I remember that you know the band stayed. I think it, it's, it was part of that club, a bob or the house right next to it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a cool place. I it, mean, it, it was. It, 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 it looked like it was in the middle of Texas or something. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if you remember. You got the, you know all the details down. But at the time, they, they, they've got these big lights that hang above the bar. They hang down on these long chains. These big metal lights. They look like they weigh a ton. And what Diego does when he, he walks down the bar and he pushes these lights, he goes whack like that, and these lights are swinging, swinging around, and they, you know they don't they don't stop for. But when they do stop, he just he just sets them all up again. He just walks them. You know, wishes these lights. Uh, and uh, I remember when I see it, I'm going, This is what a crazy place. Some lights are going to, one of them came off the chain. It, you know, it, it kills somebody outright, you know, but, but no, they don't. The bolts don't well, but that's just another just crazy thing about Nasty Boy. But they, oh, they, they really look after you, you know, you're yeah, fed yeah. well. It's good, good barbecue stuff, you know. I'm really into my barbecue, so uh, my ribs and all that. So, uh, yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd love to go back there. They, they do good T-shirts as well. And, uh, you know, the, the Nasty Boys T-shirt, it does raise my brows when people see it. And they go, oh, what's that? It's some kind of gay, gay cowboy bar. And you go, okay. <laughs> I just say, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we, these clubs, though, that we play, that we, we, we see on, along the travels, uh, you know, the, there's some great, clubs out there um oh yeah absolutely there's not much like you know, yeah. uh i would love to hear you and i'm sure our guests as well i mean our audiences audience as well to hear you play a little more you have something oh, else yeah. for you yeah um let me think what to do um 
I love your solos. You know, like I remember a few years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, uh, somebody posted, started a whole thread about you on the Art of Slut Base forum. I was like, oh, yeah, wow. I have to check out this guy. It was like yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. Oh, shame about trying to archive that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm trying to think of doing something that's different that, that I've not probably seen on the show. I don't know. Um, just doing repeating. You know, I was talking about that blues band I played for, the harmonica guy, PJ Baker. Now, he did do a couple of funk sort of songs um, that I'd kind of try and incorporate a, a slap to. Um, mm -hmm. so I could try and demonstrate that. That might be a little different. Um, and I thought I was the only guy that I hadn't heard any. I don't think I was the only guy that had done it, but I'd not heard anything before. But then I did hear um, Jason Burns did something similar on a CC Cock record and a Road King song as well. It was a Road King song. Uh, Are you going to get real? Some similar sort of thing where it's using a funk sort of slap to. Let me uh, see if I can get that going for you. Yeah, I'm excited. All right, while Nick is getting ready, make sure to hit or slap that subscribe button if you haven't already and slap that like so you can help me out with this YouTube algorithm and spread all these slap knowledge all over the YouTube. All right, let's rock yeah. and roll. So, um, we used to do a couple of things. There was an instrumental song that won't sound too interesting, but it was, um, we did a message with a kid. I can't remember who's, who did that now. It's, it's, I can't think. Anyway, messing with the kids. So you, imagine a foot, you got a funk beat. So it's got a you know, funky sort of thing. It's kind of like this. Yeah, I dig it. Yeah. Have you used it in uh, with uh, that type of playing with any of your bands? No, no, I haven't actually. Um, it's a bit on to what I'm doing, but it's what I did at the time. It kind of worked with, with that song. I do one sort of funky number um, with the Drugstore Cowboys, Tony Joe White song, but no, I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't put it in that, to be honest with you. I don't think it quite worked. But no, it's there. I don't, I don't know. Have you heard that style used in with Sap and Funk? Have you, have you got, do you know anything else? Um, I say I'd heard Jason Burns do it, but I just. Uh, well, Jason did it like with that more of a kind of uh, Zydeco type of thing. That was kind of like a, his thing. So I kind of think it was something like that, more sort of. Uh, something like that, I think. It's kind of, I'm trying to think of that. It's that Road King song. Oh, you're going to get real. I think it's called. Uh, yeah, it was. That was it. But, um, yeah. It's just another little thing. You I know, before you I'm... leave your base, I would like to ask you uh, a couple of questions. There's like lots of that I love asking my guests. And it's about different slap bass patterns and different oh, yeah. names for different slap patterns. So, are you using that regular terminology? I mean, the most standardized. To, uh, uh, terminology like single slap, double slap, triple slap, stuff like that, or you have your own way to name these patterns? Yeah, and I, I, like I said, I've watched a few of your shows, and I, I agree with most most people. And um, yeah, so I'll just go through them what how I see them. I would class the single slap as thin. Some people will call this a double slap. You know, so, so you know a pull. And a hit. So, for me, that's a single slap. Um, but then you also people will say, well, this is a single slap where you don't slap back, you know, like a more traditional pattern, which I use a lot more. I don't actually do that single slapping thing. I, I, I kind of mix it up, but I do this a lot.
So I mix the two together, you know, I give it some dynamics. I don't want to just be going like, you know, that's, I, I don't know, I don't find that tasteful. So I, I actually use the, what you could call, I've only called a jazz slap or, or I just call it like a traditional sort of way of playing, you know, just, you know, that, you're just popping the strings rather than, but do you still yeah, consider that do slap or not? Um, I guess it is, but I just think I've always called a single slap. Then, then you actually but, slap back. Okay, got it. And then a double slap, which I know you, you, you class it as a gallop, which makes sense. It does. I get that, the gallop thing. But I, I've always called it all a, a pull and two hits. That would be... That's what I'd call a double. But I get the gallop thing. It's, it's, yeah. But the triplet, triplet also has two slaps, two palm slaps, yeah, and we, right. nobody calls yeah. it uh, double Yeah, with the, drum, the drumming thing, you know, because a, tri a triplet fill was probably the first drum fill that I learned. It's like it's probably Slim Jim's favorite drum fill as well. I think, you know, it's all he it does, but you kind of like. So, you know, so. But it's probably my it's probably my least favourite slap out of all, all um, out of the slaps because it's I, I just find it's often used and abused the triple slap. Oh yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know, it, and it, it, I I kind of agree with you. But it's also I think it's the most effective for the audience. It's something that we should never forget. I think that I think mean, maybe where the it audience is, reacts to that one the best. Where people put it, it's just like rockabilly by numbers sometimes. You can be going watching a band setting up and, and the bass player will put put it always on the second bar on the one of the, of the second bar it'll, it'll be like there it is it's, it's just you've heard it a million times it's just it's just tiring and I, the minute i hear that i've kind of seen the band already kind of you know that sounds really snobby but i kind of, yeah, it's got it's got its place. I mean, I was using a triple up in that in the the funk beat, wasn't I? That funk thing I was doing. So you know, there's one there. So. There's triples actually in there. So yeah, so I do use them. And obviously, there's there's always a triple on the if you're playing like a rubber band. There's a triple there as well, isn't there? So, There's a triple right there too. So I, I do use them, but I, I, I don't. How do you call that? How do you call that? Sorry. How do you call that pattern that, that you just played? But the, I, like a rumba. I just say a rumba pattern. Rumba, okay. Yeah, is that, that one? Yeah, yeah. But no, I, 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 I try and, yeah, you never get me going. Yeah, but you know when I say used and abused, I just think sometimes. You hear them put in, into songs just because they can. You know, it's almost like, well, does it belong there? Does it actually benefit the song? Or is it just because you can do one, you know? Um, and I find, yeah, I've, that's, that's the most abused slap that I think I hear. I much prefer oh, yeah, to I, I agree with you. I agree I, with I'm you on that. For me, it was it. always like, if you can make it a part of the arrangement and part yeah. of the song that... It's it's a good a good spot to put it put slab. But if it's if it's just you know there like for whatever, I mean it works at a show at a gig, but usually not on the record that well. It's like you know to put a triple slap there. It's like it's like a drummer setting up and playing wipeout or something. You know, there's his sound check and you kind of go, mm. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, do we need to wear that? But um, no, I'm, so what? Yeah, of course, of course, there's a quadruple thing as well, isn't it? But I, I could never, I don't think I could ever find a, a place for a quad quadruple. I think I'm going to do one or something. That kind of thing. Um, I know there's a different timing you can do. I don't know that other one. But yeah, but that, I could never find a home for that in a song, I don't think. So it doesn't really count. Um, I don't think there's anything else. But I just think with my with the playing, I like to just. Um, I think it's like thinking from you know from starting off as a drummer. I think that that does still flood through into my playing because 
I like to do pushes and do offbeats. Um, uh, so if I try and demonstrate, so like a push, you know, sort of like, you know, so you'd be pushing before the beat, and then it's time, and then you do like an offbeat, so it'd be like, So you're playing after, after the beat. So, so yeah, they're, they're the sort of things that I, I incorporate into my playing. Um, but I, you know, it's just local. I don't really think there's a name for that. It's just just, um, just doing your thing and, and you know trying to make it tasteful and yeah, that's about it really. Oh, absolutely, I agree with you. And your playing is definitely tasteful and i love when you do those little, little slides oh, you, here right. and there it sounds great yeah that's great Coming just a little you, question sir. since you since you mentioned quadruple why in the quadruple you count both slaps of the string and the palm but in the other ones you count only the the palm slaps uh so what did i do in one, two, three, four. yeah i said yeah, so I'm counting the slap, the pull, and then the three hits. So, yeah, I think that's what I'm. Well, so, what, what do you call that? Or is it not? Or is it just? Well, I call that quadruple, but the other ones, you know, for me, the single slap is just your pull, because it's yeah. one. I always count the pull and the uh, and the uh, slaps of the palm. So, what, do you, what would you call? You know, the what do you call that? Single. Single. Yeah. And then what do you call that? Double. Uh, okay. That's interesting. But oh, and then yeah, and then you call that uh sorry. That'll be a uh, that'll be triple as a gallop because it's gallop. one eighth note and two sixteenth notes as 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 slaps. And then, and the then one, triple as a triplet. Yeah. Triple as a triple. Or triple so you got triple as a gallop or triple as a triple. Yeah. <laughs> A triple, I mean, triple, if you're counting the, you know, pulls and slaps, that will be as a triple slap. But yeah. um, I would, you know, as a quadruple, you can also do different things. But it's, it's if it's as long as it's that, um, that structure or form is satisfied, like to, to count all of them and then they add up to four. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, how, what would guys like, calling that stuff in the 50s and the 60s and the 80s it seems that most of the 80s rockabilly guys use the terminology like you 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 did it and then like a bluegrass people the the one that you call in rumba bluegrass people call that triple slap and um whatever you know i'm just trying to 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 document everything and then uh yeah. make sense out of it so what, somehow. What about this one, Georgia? So you, you know, like this would be called, you know, the drag thing. I've never done that. You know, the, the where people like, you know, the, the flip the hand and stuff. I, I don't do that. But so, so I'm going. You know. Would you call that? Um, a drag I mean, thing? I mean, if I have to write it down in on uh, as as notes, I write it as a ornament. Um, oh. The yeah. way they would write that down in a in a in a, in the classical music, how did I write ornaments? Um, but basically, it's just like two slaps before the beat. So it could be, if you want to call it, you can call it reverse gallop, or you can call it uh, those those drags. I never call them drags. I usually call that roll slap because you yeah. can put it, play them with the different uh, uh, different different parts of the hand. Right. So. I mean, let me grab my bass real quick. So oh, I, I was going to say, I'm going to bass. Oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> so this is what I usually call single. Could you hear my bass? Yeah, yeah. It's coming through. And double. Um. Triple as a gallop. As a triplet. Uh, quadruple. And 
can you mention that? Oh, just don't do it. Oh. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. Just don't do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get it. But yeah, okay. I mean, there are different ways I can use it. I can play quadruple as a part of... So then we have rumba. Uh, let me do this. Or full rumba, what I like to call with triple, triple and a double slap. But in this case, triple slap is not a triplet. It's just triple slap because it's uh, um, three eight notes. So... And uh, then, uh, is it distorting? Am I too loud with the bass? No, no it's fine. Sounds good. To no, me. Okay. And But if I want to add, like, for example, quadruple, instead of that second triple slap, like... Uh, like, yeah. that gives... A different vibe and what we're talking oh you we were talking about uh different roll slaps that i like to call them like the most basic one would be the one that you showed us and demonstrated uh with just fingers and, yeah and then what people call uh drag slap with with the, the whole palm yeah. um sometimes I, I add a thumb on top of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> does this answer yeah. your question <laughs> yeah that's great okay. I've, I've just thought of a couple of things actually that I've, I've written a couple of songs recently that have got i've actually done myself a bass intro song and I don't know, you could probably help me with the terminology, but I think it's, it's called like a, it's almost like a hammer on. But the, the song starts off like it's just. So I'm kind of muting with this hand. Um, I'm playing single notes here, but I'm not kind of knocking it. Yeah, yeah. It's not that, I, I hate that, that thing. That, that crap, I don't like that. But it's, it's just kind of a bit more subtle. It's... Yeah, that's something I've but you do you do use quadruple at the end, right? Yeah, I guess yeah. Oh, that, that yeah, you can tell me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, well, it's all the standard. It's just like a little different groove, but it's. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think that's the essence of your playing. That the part that kind of makes you different than the other guys. It's like the way you use these uh, slides and hammer ons. It's it's um it's different it's different and i like it it has that kind of laid back uh more like back end like blues groove yeah i mean you it's, know what i it's, think it's that, not that, pushing that, like that, most that, of the that, rockabilly guys it comes down to the experience i think i mean it's like you know you could be like jimmy jimmy for instance he's got a really relaxed type of playing and it was probably never was always that way with jimmy you know but he, he's 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 learned to crack that he's, he's just one of the best. But he, he's relaxed. And it's and it's from the and it's from the wrist. He's not he's not he's you know, his arms are not, you know, and he, in his posture's good and it's all just um it's all like relaxed and and you, you, you just do what you have to do. I know some guys that just blister to hell. And yeah, it's just like probably they're just doing more than they need to do. It's like they're giving it up you know, a hundred percent when you probably can do it for a lot less, you know, and get the same result. If that makes any sense, you know. Sure. I mean, being relaxed is one of the things that I mostly insist, you know, when I teach bass. I mean, my it's students. Right. I think that's the essence. If you're putting on a show and you're showboating a little bit, yeah, you might, you might, you know, you, get, you know, you give it a bit of, you know, but otherwise, I'm kind of, my hand rarely moves too far, you know. Like, even like. And if faster, it'd be still. I'm kind of, you know, I'm not kind of. I don't want to get too much noise off the off the fingerboard, you know. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about, and I agree with you absolutely, absolutely. No, agree with that. Uh, I've got going on a recent song I've written is is kind of like I, I play it straight, 
the riff and then I'll play it. There's just a real sort of difference to to, to how it's played. So there's this riff that goes like. That's just playing it straight. But I kind of, it's bit, I put more of a jump to it. Um, if I can, sorry. sorry. you know uh, you get that yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah so it's just little things like that that will make make you make you sound sound different you know yeah let's put this uh, definitely cool i would like to get to the last section of the interview i would like to talk about your gear and then your strings and you told me that your bass is you said the check yeah, it's just that the sickly labels fell off now, but I'm sure it said maybe chest is back here on the uh, and what is the uh, uh, do you uh, was there a brand on it or nothing? No, that's all it. No, so okay, it's, it's like, it sounds, yeah, for me, I don't know how it's coming across on this pro on this program, but it, it sounds great, it records well. <clears throat> it's funny, I got a call last year for, a couple of years ago from Jerry Chatterbox. I said, Nick, Nick, um, I need you to get a bass down to Nottingham, and I said, Why? And he says, Oh. Uh, JD McPherson's playing, and the bass has been stuck caught at the airport. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, they've lost it or whatever. So J Jimmy Sutton's bass is, it was on apparently en route to a gig, but they just didn't know ah. if it was going to get there in time. Jerry says, "Can you get a bass down?" So I took this bass down, and Jimmy had this bass, um, and uh, he played it. And he loved it. He goes, oh, I, love, "I love this bass. I, 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 you know, great, thanks." You know, he, he really took a shine to this bass. But then his bass turned up just as they were starting to sound like so he used his own but he asked me he said oh can is it okay just to keep it hanging around just in case something goes wrong or whatever and oh cool, oh, cool. Um, you know obviously it's, it's interesting you know it, that's it's an interesting point that you're talking about because i know that lots of uh roots rockabilly or like r b players in european um they really want to get old you know king moritons or or uh uh or old k's you know kind of to achieve that you know old american sound uh but like old european bases like Ch czech or czechoslovakian or romanian or russian like sound excellent i mean especially the hybrid bases and you know the plywood bases obviously um they sound great for 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 that style I personally do yeah. not think there's a need like to get an old K to achieve, uh, you know, Willie Dixon, you know, Willie Dixon slap or something. You know? some beautiful bases, you know, the higher bases that you get. Um, often the, the the most the greatest bases show up, and the, but the bridge, the bridge is always pinned, and the G strings are always kind of set kind of low sometimes. Look at with Mike, I don't have to do much slapping with Mike. Uh, but the G is always really, you know, it's like a steel set of strings and a real thin gauge, and you know, the, the G is always really low, and it, you know, so it kind of buggers me up sometimes. But I get, I get to play some. Oh, you know, you just know. I mean, I'm not an expert on these on these bases, but I get to play some wonderful bases, and sometimes you'll get something that's, you know, it's got sure, sure. And it's just it's it's about, a about a setup and setup. the fingers, <laughs> yeah, and the soul yeah. of the bass player. Uh, uh, I've only had one bass, but in my life, but I've, I've played, you know, many, uh, and uh, and that that gives you know it, it's given me a, a good uh, education in, in strings and pickups as well. You know, use different things. It's good. To that's do. what I want to ask you. Like, so what is what is your preference as far as strings go? Um, what do you use as far as gear? Been Stuff through, like that. Strings. I've been through everything, you know, when I first got my first bass, it was like, you know, you know, the nylons on there, they came off after a short time, and then they used like steel strings, they were real bad steel strings at first, Astra, I think they were called, something like that, and then I went on to Spiracle, um, is it ob ob uh, Obligato, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a Spiracle thing, it was a, I tried a red, a red uh, binding on the you know, on the, on, just on the, on the bottom. Um, and then I'm doing oh, music for names. I use this bronze set. I did it Noi and, and there was this, it was like a bronze, all bronze set. And it was uh, like a flat wound. Um, I can't remember. Well, that's useless. Anyway, where, where am I? I'm on for 
touch those. I love them. They're great. Um, I think they are Presto Lights. I, I might try the extra light. What do you use, um, George? I use uh, Tomastic. <laughs> I, and I've been using Tomastic since I started playing bass. And um, I stuck to them. You know, I've been endorsed by Tomastic for, I don't know, 10 years now. And uh, I tried different sets of Tomastics. I mean, I tried pretty much everything that it's out in the market. Uh, but Tomastics are my favorite. I either use Spyrocore or Spyrocore Solo. Usually Spyrocore Orchestra. Now, last six, seven years, they've been making me a custom set that, are, that it's for people allergic to nickel. Um, but it's, um, they wanted me to try it out because, um, they said like, oh, it sounds a little bit less metallic. So it, it can sound like really cool for your, uh, for your slap style. And I tried it and they decided not to make those strings publicly available, but they've been making me a few sets per year. So, so I've been using those mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a steel string guy for sure. I play a lot with the bow as well, so uh, and, the only bow uh, that gives, is, uh, only that gives me a bow and arrow. Yeah, very rough. I had a rough gig. I needed protection, so um, no, that's a joke. But um, yeah, pickup wise, um, you got to think that, that when I got my first pickup, you know, that's what I'm in in, in the eighties. So there wasn't a, a massive. Uh, amount available i think the, the polytone was the one that was doing the rounds at the time which i never had no, one of those. i remember that one yeah yeah they were pretty awful if i remember rightly um i don't know oh, well the, i didn't you know I, I didn't have good experiences with the guys that used them with me um and then <coughs> excuse me um i i went i went for the underwood pickup and this was recommended to me by um by Paul Diffin, you know, the blue, blue caps and, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's a great guy. He, I, I rang up a, a, a rock and roll promoter at the time. This is like before email and, you know, you have to write a letter or ring some different home, you know, no mobiles and stuff. <laughs> so, um, I rang up a, a promoter called Colin Silcox, who was like a legendary sort of, uh, a rock and roll promoter guy and said, can you give me Paul Diffin's number? He gave me his number. I rang Paul up just at home and he was he was he was a gentleman absolute gentleman and we talked for a good half an hour or so and he, he said yeah go for the uh the underwood which i did i've had a couple of underwoods actually um <coughs> um yeah um i got it from ivan Morant's music store in london he told me where to go and yeah so that was uh, a good choice i had, I had the, an underwood for about 20 years it lasted 20 years and then that broke down and then i went through a phase of the electric pickup which I'm, i've got my uh in, not my invention but i'll show you now but uh when i get that up the electric pickup which i'll show you uh, i've got another underwood and it only lasted about three years so i was really pissed off because uh you know um it, it was out of its warranty i think and uh so uh yeah one lasted 20 years one lasted four years then look at this piece this is uh i had this on my face it's like a, a wooden block of emg active pickups i had this uh on for about 10 years and i i, I wouldn't use it with with the underwood at the same time but i had the underwood on as a backup and i went and had that electric sound which i i don't really care for anymore so this is, was kind of screwed to the, the bottom of the fingerboard you see there's a so when were you using that this would have been 90s yeah about 90s. 90s okay because in the yeah, 80s like yeah. I, I would like actually to hear about it oh and nick is gone i hope he didn't lose uh, the juice on his phone Hopefully he's going to be back. I will be, I will be texting him to see. If, ah, okay, he's back. Come on, Nick. 
All right, I'm going to use this time to remind you that you should get the artist lab based t shirt here, the link. Uh, for the merchandise for these t-shirts is down below under the in the description of this video so many of you already got it uh, actually this would be a great time to invite you to send me your photo at contact at artofslabbase.com so i can feature you on art of slab base uh, instagram page send me your ig handle or facebook handle whatever you want to do and or both maybe we can post it on both medias and um and if you didn't get the t-shirt make sure to get one uh i hope you subscribe and all of that all right nick is back <laughs> i don't know what happened there it just it just went off um I'm okay off. well i'm glad you're back where was we? I got this yeah, this block, um, and it yeah, it was powered by a, a nine volt battery because of active pickups. I don't know what brand they are, uh, what make, uh, rep, uh, number they are. The MG. And I, yeah, I down for about ten years. And to be honest with you, it was a weird thing because this is when the base was the, the dark brown teak color, and I, so I had this on and I had this electric sound and did that thing with a separate slap pickup and you know a slap amp. You know all that very atheist way of doing but um so i i did that and um it come to standing the base down to getting it down to uh to the blonde so i had to take everything off the base nothing had, i don't think i've ever stripped that base down since you know in, in 10 years maybe you know um i took the base strings but i never took it apart and uh yes yeah, so i've arched it all up and put put the base back together and um just put the strings on that was obviously the, the electric pickup was going to go on last um and um i just played the bass without that block on the neck on, on the fingerboard and it sounded beautiful i was just like oh my god you know the slap sounded like like an earthy wood it was breathing again you know uh, uh, i just forgot how it sounded before i put this this dreaded block on there you know and it's just suffocating the, the sound of the bass so i never looked back you know i never i never i would never put it back on to be honest with you um so I'm, I'm back to piezo pickups you know i'm, I'm you've got the moment i've got a well i've had it on for years um a, a base max you know that's, that's what i've got on there at the moment um are you happy with it yeah yes i am yeah i don't even use you know i had a one just splitter box with a slap thing and the slap pickup is still connected but i don't know it depends what you're doing what band you're in and what style you're doing but for any, anything i do i don't really need a slap pickup to be honest with you I can pick up enough from the bridge uh, if you've got a good sound check, especially like when I was with Mike. You know, we'd always get sound checks. We didn't do many gigs where it was like, well, you know, 10 bands on and, you know, we'd get really decent checks. So I just got the, the desk, say, oh, can you just bring out the highs, bring out the high frequencies a little bit? And he'd find, he'd find enough slap for what I need. I, don't, I hate that sound, that, that kind of, where you've got that full bass signal, almost bass guitar signal and then you've got this click that's sailing across the top like a separate instrument and it, and it is technically separate because the way it, the way that can be mic'd up it's coming out of a separate amp and you know i don't i've never been a fan of that no, i like mm -hmm. it to sound as acoustic as it can you know like like a guy it's difficult though it is difficult depending on what you're doing sometimes you got it you know it's when the mic on the depends on the volume as well if you're playing yeah. an arena gig you know or a stadium yeah. gig comparable to a small club yeah it's um it's a different, so I, I, get different it. Deal. I get it you know and, and the thing that you've got more control upon say if you've got a crap sound man yeah there's this thing that you're not gonna get you know i was talking to bob cotton about it he did a, a gig for me recently he stood in for the drugstore cowboys which was a pleasure to do uh to play with bob but um we were talking the bass and stuff and he says yeah i know he says i'd I love an acoustic sound but he, you know he, he was like sometimes you just gotta get something that's you know it's going to be decent and you know you can hear it hear it you know it doesn't sound like an acoustic bass um you know so that you said it's the best you can get and it'll you kind of covered you're covering yourself you know you know you're going to get a good solid signal on both counts it's just like I say, just depends on where we have not had the need to, to worry about that it depends on what area of course different situations require 
different solutions. Yeah. And what's going on with the amps? What 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 is your preference with the amps? Well, n now I've gone. Yeah, now I'm on smart bass, and I, I struggle with my back actually. I've got, I've had like an up on my back, and had a like a, a disc removed in my neck, and all sorts of stuff. So I have to be careful. But I used a Mark bass combo. Uh, to combo down here. Combo two, it's called, uh, which is a twelve-inch speaker, you know, built-in combo, and then I use a twelve-inch extension speaker. That's my rig. I can carry it in two hands and walk into a venue, you know, uh, and there's my rig, you know, and I've set it up and I'll let, I'll let, let the PA do the work, you know, I'll let the PA do the work. Obviously, I'm monitoring this and always the best to get your bass back coming to you, but I don't know. It's like I say, again, with the stuff I'm doing, the bands I'm working with, it's enough, you know. Um, so I'm just working with what, what I need to work with, really. Yeah. All I want. I don't like the color scheme on the mark base thing. I must admit, I've, I've got to get some sort of a black netting or gauze and cover over them horrible yellow speakers. <laughs> looks like a looks like a children's toy or something. You know, the, the yellow buttons and it's like a, it's got all the qualities of a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you use any 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 other pieces of gear when you play? No, I've got no. Um, I don't use any. Uh, Preamps or anything like that. Like I say, I, I don't even use the uh, <coughs> splitter box now preamp thing. I just put that to a side. I just go directly into the amp. Very basic, mm -hmm. very basic setup. Um, yeah, I think, I think I get it. So, this show is about you know slap bass and slap and bass players, and I love asking uh, my guests: Was there any situation that you were in, like when uh, the artist <laughs> you played asked you, like? can you not slap or like you know can you just slap all the time or like but but i'm more interested in this like who would say something like you know can you never yeah, slap a, Did that a, never happen i've got a corky yeah <laughs> to tell you about. um yeah i mean i had to do it myself with some of the bands i've had you know where i had to sort of say oh can you do two to bar or to bar and that and yeah i was just do it politely and you know and uh <laughs> it's never a problem but yeah i did cop for uh, a, a good uh, fish eye it, it, I'll, I'll explain what fish eyes and eye, but uh, yeah i did a gig with a guy james hunter you know james um Paul and wilf uh i say gig it was like a, a, a he was a guest at paul ansel's oh there we go yeah there we go that was an eye yeah i love james he's great um and i got to do a set a short set with him at paul ansel's uh, club night in london and um, we were to, he just showed up. We didn't even know what songs we were playing, even when he got there. Turns up with this, like, he, he was a bit wired, I think. You know, he was, he was, he was, he was uh, yeah, a bit, he was, he did seem a bit wired. But he came in and uh, he had this, like, you know, I don't know what it was, like a 15 watt guitar amp. And it was like some kind of inferior make. It wasn't like a, you know, there's nothing I, I recognize. I don't know where he picked it up from. But he made it, obviously James is uh, it's, it's in his fingers. He made it sound amazing, and uh, yeah, and we did about six songs. So Paul Ansel's on piano. There's a guy called Jim. We call his second name. One of the London guys that plays around. He's he's great, Jim. Uh, not so much as I know. And I was on bass, and James. So we start we start off the set. It's like wow, we just straight into you know follow me sort of thing. Find the key. Um, and we did that, and uh, yeah, I just plucked my way through uh, most of it. But there's one song that I thought leaned towards, I say slapping. It was more like just you know that single thing that we we're talking about, where you just pop in rather than you know you're not slapping back or anything like that. So I did a little bit of that, I was like, duk, 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 duk. and he, he kind of he, you know, his eye came round to the side and he looked at me and he said, "Don't slap." Yeah, and I went, oh, "Okay, okay, no worries, James." You know, and come straight up it. But uh, so that's a yeah. I've been I, I made my wrist slapped uh, on that. Um, but yeah, this is funny story. But yeah, but the fish eye thing. That's that's just a, a joke that we have between um, music. The Mike Sanchez band. <laughs> it's like when, when somebody makes a mistake or does something wrong, it like you know, it's like when when your eye. It's almost like the eye comes round in the front man's eye comes round to the side of his face. <laughs> you know? It's like you know, and we've had you know, so you know, we had like. Last week, I said, you fish eyed me tonight, didn't you? You fish eyed me, you know, and it, we, we have a laugh of it. Uh, so that's what we call it. Uh, so you can spread that around yeah, around your parts, uh, George. I'd appreciate it. An old fish eye. 
you sent me a couple. You, you you sent me a couple more questions, a couple more photos, and I would like to ask you about them. Yeah. Um, so that's John. Yeah, John, me and John Lewis. I'm, I've been with John for about four or five years. John, brilliant. I love John. He's he's a one-off uh, in, in every way. <laughs> that sounds terrible. No, I mean his voice and everything. Else. And he's the last guy that I did. Uh, I did a vinyl album with him. Um, Where would rock and roll be? It's called. I've got it down here. I'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he's 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 a great guy. He's a real McCoy and. Um, yeah, I enjoy working with him. He's a good friend. And um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, we did some recording actually over the lockdown. John sent me some some a number of songs, and he put them on his band camp. And he just sent me backing tracks, and I'd record on my iPhone. It's amazing actually how good an iPhone can record a bass. I, I got I was really happy with it with it with the result. Oh I, really? I got, wow. Yeah, this sweet spot in my kitchen. What did you do like to make it sound good? But it's, it's this cabinet right in the kitchen where, where you just store towels or whatever. And I just put the, the phone in just slightly inside the cabinet. So the bass is like almost got another body there. And, and I'm, I'm playing <laughs> acoustically just into the iPhone. You, if you do it too loud, you got to you record it too loud. It'll clip. You know, you hear it. Uh -huh. But I, I got some really good results and I sent it to John. Of course, he puts it into his machine and lines it up. And you know he said it sounds great you know so we ended up doing some songs and uh and then you we gotta say i never yeah. tried it yeah no it's just well it works honestly I, well i'll get i'll do one and i'll text it to you a sound bite all right but, uh, you, do, you know just see what you think but uh obviously then he's got the option of still beefing it up or you know doing what he's on, on his desk so that we did that and then we did a recording with deep dickerson as well uh so um we did a video and a song called uh walked walked over my grave so walked over my grave and uh deep put back in vocals on so he was in you know i'd never even i never even had any contact with Deke about it but um yeah there's me deke and john on that on that particular recording and i think i, can't remember who, I think john d even did the drumming on it as well so um so that, that's a video on um on youtube check that out must have walked over i think it's called must have walked over my grave John Lewis, Deke Nixon, and myself. So that was good to do. So I've worked with Deke, and I don't even know if Deke knows, but <laughs> I've played bass with him. <laughs> Deke is great. I love playing with Deke. Yeah, he's great. I, oh, I mean, his videos. I mean, you know, the, the acapella app. Oh, uh, yeah, I, quarantine I, videos. <laughs> oh, I love that. I, I used it all over lockdown. I, I did um, I had some drum tracks from the, the new album. Uh, we'd actually recorded some drums. We did them separately because we wanted this big room sound. Uh -huh. And anyway, so I've got the, the drum tracks. Uh, so I just fed them into the acapella. Obviously, I couldn't film anything. So I just had to put a picture of the drummer. And then I'd have the phone there and the, the drums playing from a speaker into the phone. Really primitive stuff. Uh, but it sounded, it sounded, I think it sounded okay. It's, you know, what, what else are we going to do in lockdown, you know? Uh, so I, 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 did, I did it all on my phone, and uh, a few of those uh -huh. went up on, uh -huh. on YouTube. If you type in "Drugstore Cowboys Lockdown," there's about three or four new songs that uh, you know that I, I did in that way, just to keep myself busy and put something out there. Sure. It was sure. A year, a year and a half of doing nothing, you know. So uh, it's nice to just let people know we're still out there, you know, and doing it. So that, that was, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, John, he's just uh, the... Oops. I already moved to the oh, second photo. Yeah. Steph, Steph, my good friend Stephanie Powers. <laughs> See, this is, a, this is going back to the Mike, Mike thing. Uh, you know, Mike's got me into some right, um, great situations, you know, from playing Jeff Beck's 70th birthday party. Actually, I uh, got to play with Jeff Beck. And, and Josh Stone. Uh, I've got videos of that, but I've never put it That's up. all cool. That's all cool. It's a private event, so I, I'd happily send you a copy of it, Joy. But I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, please. But uh, yeah, I've got a version of me and Josh Stone and uh, Jeff's band. The, the bass player were the only one who didn't show up, so I, I got the gig. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we played Happy Birthday to him, and you know, that, that was wonderful. So you know, there's been these, these funny, you know, you can imagine Jeff Beck's 70th birthday party, you can imagine the. Uh, the cloud and the, the, the people that were there, there were some big guns there watching. So it was, it was a really good gig to do. 
I mean, we had, we had the tour around and see all Jeff's uh, hot rods in his garages and stuff as well. And yeah, it was uh, at his uh, at his house. You know, um, that's that. But this one here, this is like backstage at a, a festival in France, um, a, a place called Morand. I think that's how you say it in France. Another country festival, and uh, they, they put mics on it. I think it's just like a they want to throw something in different at the end, you know, because it's all country music. And then they put Mike on, and Mike's only probably plays about a couple of country numbers. Anyway, they have a 70s celebrity every, you know, a TV celebrity American every year to sort of uh, get to come and, you know, spread a few words. And this year it was Stephanie Powers, and she was hanging around backstage and talking to everybody, and, you know, talking about outdoors, you know, it's a lovely hot, hot summer's day. And we were just chatting away, having, having, you know, having a good chat. And uh, now, are you familiar with um, Heart to Heart, the program Heart to Heart with Robert Wagner? Do you know that? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, yeah, ring about. I can recommend it. Oh, no, but search for Heart to Heart intro okay. and you'll get to see it. Anyway, so Robert Wagner and um, Stephanie Powers, and they're like a murder mystery solving couple, you know, it's in this, this 70s program. Um, I thought it was aired in America, but I don't know, was it? Anyway, yeah, it was legendary over here. And uh, this Max, this old guy's talking, it's going, when they, you know, he says, uh, Mrs. H, she's gorgeous. And, uh, and then he's talking about this, this Roger Hart guy as well, it's Robert Wagner. And, uh, and then there's this line at the end of the intro, it goes, and when they met, it was murder. He says, like, like, like murder, but murder. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'd always seen that as a kid, and uh, anyway, I'm chatting to Stephanie, and uh, and she's she's great, friendly. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get in with this line here. This is I've got to do this, but this would be funny. And uh, I said, oh, you know what, Steph? So you know, as we're friends and stuff, of course, Steph. You know what, Steph? You know what? When we met, it was moida. <laughs> she she pissed herself laughing. She was laughing. She went. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, you're so funny. You're so funny like this. And at this moment, I was just thinking, I'm either going to get thrown out by security in the next minute or so, or she hasn't heard that line a million times. And she actually just really believe that I'm funny. And um, yeah, the security didn't come and get me and throw me out. And we, uh, we, we sat, we spoke for about another 10 minutes. And then we had that, that photo taken. That you just showed and uh and everything was fine but that was that was a funny moment i mean just just stuff like that you know it's good it's, it's, the players is great in that but sometimes you just have great experiences and you meet like the weirdest weirdest you know scenarios it's another one with mike we, we did a, a, a wedding do for a, a lady called uh emira uh montgomery it's colin montgomery it's like a world-class golf player anyone who knows golf will know colin montgomery his, his, his ex-wife, she's, you know, he, she took him for eight million and married this aviation tycoon guy. And we got booked for the wedding. Um, so we're there. It's a very small wedding, but in a, in a, in a mansion, and, you know, uh, real posh, posh private land and everything else, whatever. So we, and there's guests there. Patty Boyd was there. Uh, Mike Rubber from um, Genesis. And Roger Taylor from Queen. And then this guy from Kilroy Silk, who's like kind of a schmucky daytime TV host guy. And you, I don't know if you get him over in where you, where you are. Probably not. Um, but anyway, so I'm playing my bass and uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, oh, it's like some mad acid dream or some crazy dream. I'm looking out and there's two people dancing on the dance floor, like two meters in front of me. And it's Roger Taylor from Queen and Kilroy Silks having a dance together like this. You know? <laughs> I'm just looking, playing my bass going, what the fuck? <laughs> what am I doing? What is this? <laughs> Just, I don't know. They're just silly ones, silly situations. But absolutely, yeah. I mean, those are you know the best situations that you can you know happen backstage after the show, before the show. Another gig that I want you to tell me about that you played with that are slap bass rockabilly legend is this photo that you sent. Me. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially <laughs> big in England, I would say. Well, you know, you know what, if you had said to me, because, you know, when I was at that, that the club that I told you about, TUL club, when I was seven years old, wetting me air in the toilets, listening to Ray Campy, you know, if you had told me then that I'd be playing, backing in, playing guitar, I wouldn't have believed you, you know, same as, you know, most of these artists, you know, 
because uh, I've, I've backed a few people up with Mike, you know, as well, like you and Jesse and Big Jay McNeely and, you know, uh, Little Willie Littlefield and people like that, you know, I could actually back these guys up. Um, but yeah, I, that, this is uh, with the Hemsby House band, this was. Um, uh, but this is actually, uh, this photo is from the Rockers Reunion in Reading in London. And I played guitar for Ray. Uh, and then I did a, another show at the Hemsby Festival. The, the Hemsby House Band there, which was Paul Gaskin, Mark Sprex, and uh, oh, I can't remember the keyboard player's name. Damn it. Anyway, yeah, the good, you know, um, so that, it was great to do that, but to work with Ray. Um, yeah. It, 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 so, it, and what it, was that about? Like, uh, did you go on tour with him, or you played one uh, show? Or? No, it's just just two gigs, uh, George. A. It's only two gigs, but it, you know. It, it, you know, and they, sadly he's, he passed. You know, but uh, uh, he, he, he tell you, Ray was a great guy. You know, after the Reading gig, we we, we sat in our hotel, and he, he's got some stories. I mean, you met Ray? Oh you? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I think right. everybody's met Ray. He's just around. He just, you know, at a gig, he'll just walk out, and he's just around, isn't he? He, he meets people. And he's he's friendly and he's so witty and funny. But he's got like he got stories. He would tell me about meeting Elvis before he went in the army and all this sort of stuff, and. You know, um, and he kept us up all night in the bar. We're just chatting in and he was listening to these stories. Anyway, he, go, he goes off to the toilet. He says, oh, I'm just going to get toilet. And he, he, went, he, he went up and came back. And I don't know if it was a joke or not, but he says to me, oh, only in England. He says, the guy on the, the, guy on the, the, guy on the side of the door is wearing a skirt. <laughs> and he didn't laugh. He's obviously been in the ladies. You know, in the ladies' toilet. <laughs> I was like, I was waiting for him to laugh, and he didn't laugh, and I thought, really? <laughs> so, silly story, but yeah. Oh, Ray, Ray, Ray told me to turn down. Yeah, I remember we were rehearsing, me, and it, my, my amp was close. My guitar amp was like, if I had moved it another millimetre, it would have been off. You know, he really mm -hmm. suffered with his ears. We were, mm. It wasn't ideal that we were rehearsing in a gymnasium, to be honest with you, in an empty gymnasium. But um, so, uh, but yeah, he told me to turn down. But luckily, at the gig, you know, I could, you know, the monitoring, I could sort it out. So yeah, but, you know, that's me. cool. Like all these, you know, I love hearing all these cool stories with, you know, especially from slab bass players like you. It's and then now all these people can hear them on the on YouTube and the slab. Oh, no, it's great to tell tell a few stories. I mean, it's it's good to have this documented from you know for. For a lot of reasons, you know, for the base. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's just, it's just like a memento of, of what you've done so far. And thank you for having me, George. Um, of course, of course. You know what inspired me, like to do these? It's uh, it's when I was in New Orleans. Uh, I was at the Jazz Archives at Tulane University, and I noticed that I had all these um, interviews from old musicians, you know, from the 20s and 30s that were recorded in the 40s and 50s and 60s. I was like, you know. I actually think that all these guys that I like, you know, especially slap bass players that never get any media attention, that I should document that. And that's kind of like what or the bug in my my brain, like, oh, I really want to do this. Uh, and and now we're the 60th episode, and then we've been talking for two and a half hours almost. That's, that's all right. Um, yeah, I pretty much asked you everything I wanted to ask you. Is there anything else that you that you want to mention and or talk about um no i think i think covered nice thing. I, I maybe you do you do ask a question sometimes about like you know how to get a gig and what's the best thing to do oh yeah yeah, yeah. of just, course I like that question um i mean it's like what i said earlier on i mean just just i think you need to get out and be be, be you know go go get out don't just stay you know in a bubble Get out and see the bands that you enjoy, and and be polite and introduce yourself. You know, and if you think that you, you know, you're up to the mark to, you know, uh, to properly, possibly debt for them or whatever, then just go and pick pick the right moment and speak to people. You know, um, personally is always best. I think if you like, say, pick the right moment and uh, go and speak and, and let know that you you're around. You know, and, um, and like I say, you know, he's not doing harm in the days. I, I'm not really doing those demo tapes anymore, as such, but because uh, I've got enough enough things to to use, you know, and footage and everything else, you know, the reputation follows you around. But um, yeah, yeah, don't be, don't, be, don't, don't 
you know, don't worry about your pride. Just, just put yourself out there. And, and if you get offered a debt gig, you know, do a good job. Do a good job. You know, and and and, and nail it. You know, and even even if it ends up just one gig or whatever, it's all knowledge. You've learned, you've done a job, and you've done it well. It's all knowledge anyway. And uh, so that goes to You know, I, I've got depth sort of pay for me. They've done a good job, and I, you know, I'll get a call. Somebody wants some base pay. will say, "Can you do this?" I say, "No, I'm out. I'm sorry, but I can." You know, this guy will do a great job, and that's how it works. That's how I will recommend people and. Hopefully, people do the same for me. And so, yeah, get yourself in the bank. Just, you know, obviously, do, do your homework and, you know, um, yeah, give it your best shot, definitely. You know, and, get out. and one more one more question that I actually always ask at the end is, what inspire you to still do what you do and still be excited about music and and touring and recording and all of that? And yeah, slapping. I mean... Uh, you know, you know yourself, yourself, George. As a musician, when you know, it's a lovely feeling. When you, it, it's a pain in the arse. All, all the rest of it sometimes getting there, and you know, it's tough. You, you sometimes you're flying in at stupid hours, and you're, you're tired and everything else. But that, that the moment you actually walk out and do a show, you, you can't explain that feeling. It's great, you know, and you're entertaining, and uh, and, and it, it, you know, and then yeah, I never want to. I, I love that feeling. Whether it even be like a little pub gig or whatever if there's like 30 people there or, or 300 people or whatever 3,000 people if it's you know if they want to see you and they smile when you walk on that's just the best feeling really it's to entertain and uh and do what you do you know um yeah i can't imagine not ever playing you know i, I know musicians that just hung up the guitars hung up their instruments i don't play anymore and i can't imagine ever doing that you know um yeah it's an absolute lifeline really yeah I believe that lots of people, lots of our colleagues feel the exact same way. You know, without music, it would be just part of us missing. We would not be complete. I think, people, un I think people underestimate music. They don't like in, in general, man, you, you, you watch a film without music and, you know, it's not scary. You know, if it's a scary movie and it's got no music in it, it's not going to be scary. You know, just <laughs> music is everywhere. It's around. It's just, it, it just raises emotions and, and every, you know at all times you know, it's, it's the most powerful thing I, I think it really is you know you know so absolutely that's that question to go would you have music over sex and i was like well, i don't know <laughs> 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 i wouldn't i wouldn't have uh, music over chicken wings but there's no shortage of chickens so um i'm, I'm not going to worry about that one. yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for being a part of the slap stream uh be in the in the 60th episode well, thanks a lot yeah. for doing what you're doing for slapping the way you're slapping for the, you know to thanks for all the music that you brought to the uh, world to sometime, um, Jordy. I, 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 I don't know if, um you know what you got planned gigs wise and stuff but you know um, i'll certainly uh get in touch if i see tiger army uh, do, do you play in england too often um yeah, we usually play, but you know, now since this whole end of the world thing is happening, so I don't know when it's gonna be next time. Yeah. But it will be I'm you know, I would love like, you know, hope that our path's gonna cross again yeah. sometime in the near future, you know, when we I'll all make, start I, to be honest, I, I, make, I make it out to the festivals, you know, the, the Spanish festivals and the you know, the rock and race and you know, I saw um Bo sample actually before um I'm not pronouncing his name right there, aren't I? Um, yeah, I saw um, I saw him play um, just just before the lock just before lockdown actually. Um, mm -hmm. at race, he, he's he's great. Yeah, I enjoyed his, uh, his playing and he, and his his his, his slap stream. Excellent player, yeah. Excellent uh, player. Great. I love Bo. I featured him. Uh, I don't know, maybe six months ago or something. But yeah. excellent player. Always enjoy all his projects thanks yeah. so much nick uh thanks yeah, for everything yeah. and I have, a, have a good week and um you too well. good luck with everything yeah thank you very much all yeah, righty bye bye good, good bye, bye, -bye. <laughs> all right that was the 60th episode of the slap stream with georgia live from slapsville i hope you were a subscriber if you're not a subscriber make sure to hit that subscribe button somewhere around here 
and uh, slap that like so you can help me out with this this uh, YouTube algorithm and spread the slap based knowledge all over the world via YouTube for now. Um, thank thanks a lot for everyone that bought uh, Art of Slap based T shirts. I finally got one in black. I had the red one for a while, but now I have this one in black, and I'm really kind of stoked about it. So I'll be wearing that one a lot. If you want to get one, make sure to hit that uh, link in the description of the video, and you can get both of them. You can get one on get like red and and black, and we also have those. Um, don't forget, never fret. Uh, t-shirts as well to show your love for the upright slap base and um, hope you enjoyed the 60th episode hope you gonna check out the donation links venmo and paypal in the description of the video and patreon please check out the patreon that's actually what's really helping me uh without my passion for slap base uh, that's what's keeping me going for 60 episodes so far uh click on it become a member uh join the art of slap base and slap stream as a slap stream supporter and don't forget never fret slide it in smooth and keep it in the groove this is georgia and now we'll see you next saturday